Oh, hi guys! Welcome to Marvelous Movie Mondays. Uh, I'm Dill. This is Kelsey. To my oh wait, hi. I actually pointed the right way. I usually think to point the opposite. Anyway, um, welcome to our commentary track of a film that came out ten years ago that nobody's ever heard of. Kels, um, you excited to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy today? A film we've. I'm very excited about to talk about. <laughs> I'm very excited to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy. Anyone who's been keeping up with our podcast knows that this film holds a special place in my heart and I'm excited to revisit it. It's been a minute since I've watched it in full for sure. I feel like the last time I did was during the pandemic. So like four wow. years ago now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Four years. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is part of our ongoing uh, retrospective series, our 2014 retrospective. We're going to start about two minutes. So get your Disney pluses ready. We don't play the movie for you because of copyright. So you will have to play the movie, but we will be here to talk while you play that movie. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a little while, um, but this is a part of our 10 year retrospective. It's been 10 years since guardians came out. We did one last week for winter soldier. Go check that one out. And uh, we still have more retrospective videos themed around Marvel to come. Um, but yeah, this is Guardian. So in about 30-ish seconds, I will tell you all to press play. So get your remotes ready. Get your fingers ready if you're watching on a laptop. Or get your mind ready if you have this movie in your brain and don't need <laughs> a video. Um, and then we'll get into it, Kels. Because uh, I know, yeah, you you once called this your favorite movie ever. Um, yeah. At a point. There would be times where not even Marvel movie, but people ask would ask, is this your favorite movie? And you would say, it is. So I'm very That excited. is true. That is true. It's... Picking a favorite movie is like picking a favorite song to me, Dale. Right. It's, it changes based on the mood and the time. So it is two minutes. So we are going to do a countdown. We'll, we'll start at 2.15. How about that? So we're at 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Play the movie. And right away, very abnormal to how our Marvel movies start. We're mm. not starting with our Marvel intro. We're starting with Earth 1988. I love commentaries because we're already in it. We're, we're right in it. We just start. We have no preamble. We're in it. It's two minutes and we're watching a movie. Oh, that's right. I forgot it opens with him as a kid. In my brain, I'm always like, oh, it opens with him dancing to come and get your love. But I forget. Right. Because that's yeah. the iconic scene from all of this. But we do get a little cold open here before our Mar Marvel intro. One that's more on the sadder side. Right. It's kind of like the up thing. It's like, this is going to be a really fun family adventure, but first, you must suffer. Right. <laughs> with exactly. Sadness. Yeah. Um, speaking of sadness, best movie I watched this week. I haven't watched a lot of movies this week, uh, but I did see Inside Out 2. Didn't like it as much as other people did, but I did enjoy okay. it. Um, so sadness made me think of that because not that I felt sad watching that movie, but uh, if anything, I felt Ennui. That is one of the characters in that movie, though. Yes, Sadness. That's the exactly. That's what made me think of it. Uh, best thing you watch this week, Kels, while we while we uh, try not to focus on the trauma that's going on right now in front of us? I mean, it, it's definitely not the best, but the one movie that I did go out to see in theaters was Strangers, The Strangers Chapter 1. And you, went, was... well, you went to theaters. Okay. So that's at least yes. heightens the experience, well, I feel like. Yeah, I went to, you know, I went on a Tuesday, so it was like $5 movies, even yeah. though that doesn't really affect us as A-listers, but my yeah, but other If you bring friends, a guest, it's like, oh, yeah. Exactly. You know. Oh, when the total was fourteen ninety five, oh my God, it was beautiful. Good stuff. Um, but like I said, wasn't the best thing, but it's certainly very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So what's the deal with this, this actress? She plays another role in the MCU, correct? From, from what I recall? Yes, so she has a short little scene in Captain America, the first Avengers. First Avengers right. Where the first Avengers? Hello. Sorry, I had a few Just glasses one. of wine at dinner. Um <laughs> I'm the opposite. I, I have not drank at all today, so I'm a little bit more surprised. I think the problem with the last episode was that Kelsey was so tired and I was yeah. very not tipsy, but like I, I was in my beer mode. I was like, I don't I don't want to turn my right. brain on. And Winter relaxing. Soldier is a very wordy, talky film. Whereas this one I think is mm -hmm. more of the laid back, sit back, relax thing, but I'm much more alert. So We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, she's in the first Avenger. But she had the first she yes, she was in the first Avenger and she like asks Captain America for like a photo or an autograph or something. And people mm -hmm. have pointed this out being like, oh, Meredith Quill is like from the 1940s. Like, you know, she I mean, must yeah. have this like mystical element to her. Yeah, well, think about it. Like timeline wise, I, I think it would be a little skewed because this is an 88, right? So that would have been like mm -hmm. a good 40, almost 50 years ago. So if yeah. she was a, like a teen, she'd be like in her 60s. And I just don't think that makes sense. So there has also been mm -hmm. a theory that 
that was Peter Quill's grandmother. Um, mm. And that she was a young mother, and that's who this mother is. So if this woman's yeah. about 20, her mother would be about like 50, 60. That kind of lines up, I think. Um, I like that theory a lot. Um, I like that theory too. Yeah, yeah. Just just because, of course, if the same actress plays two roles, they must be related, you know? Because <laughs> uh, Gemma Chan's characters in Captain Marvel and the Eternals are, are you know, related. Um, right, of course. You know, so now, obviously, uh, a young Peter Quill is getting picked up by the Ravagers mm -hmm. right now. And the honestly, this is making me think of, uh, you know, our What If episodes that we've gotten. Yeah, we've now gotten we've two... seen, like, the alternates, yeah. Yeah, we've seen two episodes now in What If that are surrounding this plot line of Peter Quill, and one of them has to do with T'Challa, the other is if, you know, he did get picked up and brought to Ego like he was mm -hmm. supposed to. And not, you know, the alternate like we see in this film. It's yeah. just very, very interesting. It must have been very interesting because I, I don't remember the advertising for this movie at all at the time. I feel like mm -hmm. from the from the post-Avengers to pre-Avengers Age of Ultron phase, I feel like those movies weren't marketed very well. Like, I don't remember seeing a lot of trailers for Iron Man 3, Thor the Dark World, Winter mm -hmm. Soldier, or this. I remember seeing mm -hmm. a lot of trailers for Ant-Man just maybe because it was Paul Rudd and that was a bigger bankable star. Whereas Chris Pratt was still on the rise. This is like the first film that he does in his like movie star era um, before he mm -hmm. goes on to do like Jurassic World and Passengers. But I remember just kind of hearing about this when it came out. I never saw this in theaters, but I saw it because it was nominated for some Oscars. And I was like, oh, I should watch all the Oscar nominees. And that's how I discovered it on a DVD one day. Like it wasn't even like a big deal even when it came out, I don't think. I mean, it was for the Marvel circle. I still wasn't like a super fan yet, but it's it's mm. just very interesting because I feel like they didn't market it very well. But even the marketing, I have to imagine, was more comedic centric. So when you're watching this right. film and you see that first opening sequence, I'm wondering how many people were like, what are what are we watching like isn't this supposed to be fun and like dandy and cheery um and i i think that's kind of the pixar thing too like pixar always markets their films to be really fun and, and family friendly and then when you see it you're like holy shit that ripped my heart out um so i think just very interesting you know leading off with that sequence to be like this ain't your mother's superhero comedy <laughs> i don't know right um because marvel's yeah. usually darker and deeper and more serious so it was like oh i thought this was supposed to be the funny one and that's why i think this build-up mm -hmm. is also so great because it's you know that music is very epic and like it's a slow build you know we're, we're not getting into the funny stuff yet and then there's that immediate switch that'll happen very soon and even star lord himself with this mask we don't even know that is star lord because he's got like this kind of almost villainous look to him when we first see him here in the shadow with the with the glowing eyes you know mm-hmm like this whole setup, I am sure people were like, am I at the right movie? You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, right, right from the get go, it just sounds like James Gunn had such a unique take on what he wanted mm -hmm. to do with his Marvel movies. Like, obviously, they all have to connect in some way, but he really wasn't afraid of like applying his own voice and uniqueness yep. and whimsy to, you know, this entire this entire three films he did you know what i mean yeah absolutely and and i do think it's also like his his background is so focused on like there we go the, the music kicking in and like this is where i think yep. the audience was like oh okay i get it and that's why the right. title see this title pops up right now because it's like oh okay no this is the movie you, you came here to see um it's right. almost like this false like kind of pull the rug out under you thing but i will right. say what i was what i was about to say though is that like his his basis is so like kind of fucked up twisted comedy very inappropriate trauma. So like, I, I think for a lot of people, like they were not sure how he would fit in necessarily to a more family friendly universe, but I think he really bridged that gap very successfully. And I think he even did it better in volumes two and three. Like this is my least favorite of the three and it's still a great movie. You know, I think that mm -hmm. goes to show, you know, how good he is just evolving his style to match the franchise without losing sight of his style, which is really important, you know? Yeah. It's crazy, Jill, that we're only what, we are about seven minutes into this seven film right now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've already like gotten the script flipped on us like so many times. Like we start right. with like the prequel or like the flashback, I flashback. should say, in the beginning. And then we start this whole opening sequence of this seemingly menacing figure in like a long trench coat with a mask. And we think that it's going to be this like crazy, intense, like kind of super serious scene. And then all of a sudden he turns on his Walkman, starts dancing to the music. Right. And now again, it's going to happen a third time when all when of a sudden he's again. like, right. yeah. like, oh, you might know me by another name. 
Star Lord. And they're like, what? And so yeah. it, just like time and time again, the audience cannot keep up with like what direction this yeah. movie is going to take. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I Which think that's why, the exciting part yeah. of it all. Which is why it's really cool when like in Guardians 2 and 3, it kind of pivots back to the more serious stuff. Because then when the serious stuff does happen, it feels so earned because mm -hmm. this whole movie is meant to be light that when it does get serious, it matters. You know what I mean? Oh, there it is. The orb. That's so exciting. I think I lost, is. so I had a little, there was a little crystal that came in this that I lost. It's like, it was a little purple crystal that I just don't have anymore. Oh, bummer. It's oh, somewhere. So you it's, you it's had somewhere. a power stone. I did, but I lost it. So what you're I would saying is, is that you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't be trusted with any of the infinity stones is what I'm hearing. Um, no, but Thanos would freaking love me because I'd, you know, probably give it away <laughs> very easily. Misplace them. <laughs> yeah. This is actually part of a box set. I might as well show it off, but um, I'm putting big eyes over here. I've got all my 2014 Blu-rays around. Yeah, so this this sits on this little like titanium mm -hmm. thing, and it's got all the Phase Two films in there. So Iron Man Three, Thor: The Dark World, Gar uh, Captain America: Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Age of Ultron, Ant Man, and then a bonus disc, which I actually don't know what the bonus disc is, but. Tell go. us what the and, bonus and the artwork, disc is. Artwork is is very nice. So it's got Ooh. like, yeah, Stunning. It's Ronan, Ronan and Nebula, and then like the whole Guardians crew on the front, which I really, yeah. really like. And then inside, it just has two discs. One is a 3D Blu-ray. One is a regular Blu-ray. Yeah, Sexy. very clean, clean box set. Clean box set. You want to know what the bonus disc is? You said. Yeah, I do. It's got Daddy T on the front. Oh God. It looks like, hmm. oh, a bunch of digital codes to, to redeem. Someone could have paused that right now and redeemed them. Congratulations. Oh. Um, let's see. I actually don't know what this bonus disc is. It's just got the, the Infinity Stones on the front. It doesn't describe. Like, look at the disc. Isn't that cool? Different Infinity That's really, stones. really cool. I just don't know what the disc is. I guess I'll find out someday. I should, I should actually, I, at a point, I probably knew what it was because... I did watch these back before Disney Plus was a thing. This is how I watched Marvel movies was physical media. And I still wish I could hearken back to those days, you know? Wow. So here's a fun fact that I just read, Bill. Yes. It says, James Gunn stated that Chris Pratt's audition was so good, he was prepared to offer him the role, even if Pratt did not lose weight or get in shape in time. Gunn joked that he would willingly put... Uh, he was willing to CGI a six pack on Pratt's body. However, Pratt that. asked John Gunn, "Sorry, I'm I'm a little drunk." Uh, you gave him like six however, months or something. Yeah, he asked him to give him six months to lose fifty pounds, and yes. he ended up losing sixty. Yeah, um, I'll admit, like a few things. First off, the fact that superheroes fuck is important to note here because I feel like a lot of the superhero movies that we see in the MCU are so family friendly that it seems like uh -huh. they don't ever, ever get into that side of things where it's like, yeah, they have one night stands. They're, they're freaking celebrities. Of course they do. And, and he's the one who's not yeah. a celebrity anyway. Um, second. Yeah. I, I did read that. And, and I, I like that because it's like Chris Pratt, you know, setting a motivation for himself, whatever. But I, I do like the idea that James Gunn was willing to cast him regardless. Like, I think that says a lot about mm -hmm. Gunn as a filmmaker, and that he's not looking for the perfect cookie cutter type of movie to make. You know, he's willing to just like let it be um, however it may be. And he's looking for the talent and the humor and all that. Um, I actually mm -hmm. did pull up trivia this time, too, which is good. Like, I usually have. That oh, great. Last, last time, Kelsey really helped with the load um, because the Winter Soldier I was totally not prepared for. But another thing I forgot to bring up at the opening scene, Hooked on a Feeling was supposed to be the opening song, but it just didn't fit the vibe. So they uh, put Come and Get Your Love. They mm. changed that. That was like a retrospect. Uh, thing so i think even in reshoots they reshot the scene to make it more come and get your love because i think originally he yeah. was coming in with hook on a feeling so and it wasn't until in post they were like ah, it doesn't work so they reshot that little bit where he's like singing along yeah i remember watching an interview of james gunn and how he says he literally writes in the needle drops into the script of like yeah. what songs he wants yeah and i think that that's just so genius Ugh. because also if there's the music is so integral for these movies. Yeah. It's not just a soundtrack. It is a character 100%. in itself because it's also the connection to his mother. It's, it goes beyond just fitting the tone of the scene, but also making an emotional response for him, the character. Mm -hmm. So this is our introduction to Yondu. Yes. Like we're introduced to him as like the, not the main antagonist, but 
definitely and one of them. Yeah. And uh, Sans Mohawk. I always forget we don't see like a, a real s- signature Mohawk from him. It almost looks wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like a bad haircut. <laughs> Dark Aster Cree warship. This is the stuff that trivia people do so well that I could never. The Cree warship, the Dark Aster. I think we, I think we've we've uh, asked that before. What's the name of Ronin's ship? The Dark Probably. Aster. Probably. Do you know the name of Thanos's ship? Uh, I watched so much Star Wars in the last few months, uh, so <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say a Star Wars ship. Is it the Slave Two or is that a Star Wars ship? That's close, cool. really close still. It's called Slave Sanctuary one? 2. Oh, that's what it is. So Slave 1 is Boba Fett's ship. Sanctuary mm. 2 is Thanos' ship. See, there you go. Star Wars and Marvel mixing together. I do like the Kree designs a lot in this film. Because this is the yeah. first time we see the Kree, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we don't see them again until Captain Marvel. I don't think they do enough good enough job making Ronan stand out amongst the Kree, but I think the just overall design of the Kree is, is really, really good. Right. Just like the eyes and the skin and, you know. And this is a really eerie sequence. Like, I'm pretty sure he chops this guy's head off and now we just watch the blood, the blood run. I love that. Run down this. Mm-hmm. Very, very dark. Again, very James Gunn, but a little less fun in how he does it. He's taking it in a more like dark, serious mm-hmm. superhero approach. Which is fun to say superheroes are serious because really they're just men in tights running around. But the MCU is serious up to this point because it's it's been coming off a serious run. Iron Man three deals with PTSD. You know, Thor: The Dark mm-hmm. World, dark is in the title, and it sucks. And Winter Soldier, you know, like very uh, big heavy stuff like Hydra infiltration. You know, Nazis, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so like. Yeah, this is much needed levity, I think, after three very heavy films. Even the Avengers gets heavy at a point. You know, we lose Coulson, we think, you know. Oh, Karen Gillan, so good. So Zoe good. Sorkanya, so good. Both of them, just so good. Lee Pace, so good. Not 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 his best role, but, he, but he's good in it. He does a good job. Yeah, it's crazy that this is the same Lee Pace that's in Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Like, yes. that's insane. I'll admit, the best thing I've seen Lee Pace do was on Broadway in Angels in America with uh, Andrew oh. Garfield. He is so good in that show. Did you oh see it? Oh, my God. No, I wish. Oh, he is I've so seen good. clips of Andrew Joe. Garfield in it, but... Mm-hmm. He plays Joe, who's, like, the man who's married and, and, and has to, like, basically come out to his wife. So that Because mm-hmm. it's very interesting. Angels in America, like, there's so many different stories going on about the queer experience and totally different lenses. Oh, here we go. Speaking of different lenses, we have the introduction <laughs> of Rocket. Our Rocket introduction. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like they don't do this a lot in the subsequent films, the whole eye thing. Right. Yeah. Like where his eye is like robotic. Yeah, he's kind of like tracking everyone. Oh, no, it's not. This... He's holding up a screen. Yeah. Where is he? Was that his eye or is that the screen? No, I think he was holding up like a a uh, lens. That's why. Okay, so that's why he's... he doesn't... He's tracking to see if anyone has a bounty on them for, gotcha. for money. See, I thought he was like looking at it like a special contact lens or something. Like, why don't they oh, do yeah, that sure. in future films? But that makes sense. Um, 40,000. That's a lot. Um, Stan Lee cameo. Let me just tell you. I have. I got to sneeze, then I'll tell you. Oh, okay. Uh, bless you, Dill. Thank you. Um, so Stan Lee's cameo originally was going to have him being one of the collector's trophies. He was going to be boxed up, and he was going to be giving Groot the middle finger. Disney didn't like the fact that Stanley was flipping him off, so they made James Gunn change it. Mm. Again, studio interference. You can't even get it past Gunn sometimes. Yeah. Uh, which is why I like that Gunn is now the head of DC, because anything's going to slide for him. He'll be like, yeah, right. flip him off. Anything like that. Oh, there's the orb again. Love my orb. Also, the makeup, so good. So good. So guys. good. That makeup is terrific. Just I like still a really think solid makeup job. Guardians 3 should have won for makeup for just like everything. The, the most prosthetics ever used in a film, period. Um, mm-hmm. and it didn't even get shortlisted. And what won last year? I can't even remember. It, it was that insignificant that I don't even remember what won. It, it was probably whatever one who, who won Best Actor. It usually goes hand in hand with that. Or best actress. Okay. Oh, poor things. Poor things is good, but like oh, poor things. The makeup, one hair the makeup, makeup. Yeah, like the hair. She has long hair. She's got good hair. You know, makeup. Willem Dafoe's face, but that's it. Did that movie also win costumes? Yes. 
Okay, costumes, costumes I makeup, get. And hair yeah. and makeup, nothing, nothing that special happening. It's good, in but things. it's not as it's much not as I loved it. Yeah, it's not an exceptional job. So you want to hear what the makeup nominations for 2014 were, Kels? Yeah. There are three films. I don't know if you're going to get the other two. One of them is a very depressing wrestling drama starring Mark Ruffalo and Steve Carell. Uh, and the reason they got the nomination is because Steve Carell is in a ton of makeup. It's called Foxcatcher. Do you remember that movie? Oh, yeah. yeah I've heard of yeah. that. Yeah. So Steve Carell basically has this whole transformation. He barely looks recognizable as Steve Carell. So I get why mm. they gave him the nomination. Then uh, the Wes Anderson film, Grand Budapest Hotel, gets nominated mm. and wins. It wins the mm -hmm. Oscar. And then Guardians is also nominated. So three nominees. Guardians doesn't win. A little bit surprising, but I, I get it. Um, Guardians is also nominated though for visual effects, which we covered last uh, week on the Winter Soldier um, recap or commentary, um, in which Interstellar beat them all uh, because mm -hmm. Interstellar was really stellar. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Send the name. Yeah, I really like this intro. Um, just how you know the Guardians, the first time they are together, are opponents in a way. Um, it's kind of that fun like. Not enemies to lovers, but like in a similar. No, but vein. kind like, of. I mean, yeah, they're they're they're, they're like no, not on the same team, but they're almost bonded by being against each other. Right. That makes sense. And I just love the little gadgets like that. And there comes big old G. There he goes, like a G. Root. Oh my god. I don't think I. I'm not a person who believes in love at first sight, but I really <laughs> fell in love with Groot mm -hmm. at first sight. Yeah. He's great. Like, I, I, just... I don't have any Groot fun facts. I mean, the fun facts I feel like everyone knows. Like the fact that Vin Diesel also did all the Spanish and Japanese, like all the different dubs for different countries. Vin oh, Diesel yeah. did them all. Because it's just three words, you know? Right. I would love to know how many times in the totality of his career he has said... I am great. It's got to be a million, at least, right? Maybe? I would put it definitely somewhere in the thousands. I don't know. A million okay. seems kind of like a lot. I don't know, though, because you also think he probably doesn't impress junkets and like quoting things or just practicing his lines. You know, then he got recording his lines in different languages in three films, plus the, the short film, the short films, the I am Gert short films. I don't know. Do you want to know what, uh, or do you know what two pop culture characters uh, Chris Pratt modeled his uh, performance after? Do you want to know something, Dill? I just read this fact. <laughs> so I guess? literally was just going to say it myself. Um, let me see without... There's one, there's one obvious one that I think a lot of people immediately drew comparisons to just because of the galaxy nature of it. Okay, I, I know. I know them. Okay. Han Solo. Yes, from <laughs> Star Wars. Good. <laughs> and Marty I didn't McFly. Know if you knew. From Back to the Future. There you go. Um, I just wasn't sure if you knew the Star Wars character, just because. But but I feel like even if you don't watch Star Wars, you know who Han Solo is. You know, it's Harrison Ford. He's kind of. The I, I mean, I know the name of the style. characters: Luke, Leia, Han Solo, yeah. Chewbacca. I don't know all of their <laughs> arcs and what happens to them, but I know their names: R two D two. C-3PO. Oh, there it is. Um, there it is, right on Dill's mug. R2-D2. Um, yeah, no, very good. Uh, yeah, The Han Solo comparison is very apt. Like, this is a very Han Solo-esque character. Not really given a lot of Fs, kind of being a bit of a bad boy, but also having a heart yeah. of gold. Not wanting to mm -hmm. admit he has a heart of gold. Like, kind of, he's almost too cool to have a heart of gold. Uh, I think he's a little bit more emotional than Han Solo is. Han Solo is just stone cold cool. Subject 89P13. Right, which so this is a big one. This that. Flora Colossus right there. That it was a very controversial trivia question when yes. asked what Groot's species was. And I forget what trivia right. it was, but someone did say he is Groot. But that is technically, according to this, not correct. His space, uh, his species is Flora Colossus, as confirmed by this scene. Uh, Chris Pratt improv the, the middle, middle finger. finger. <laughs> Seems like a Chris Pratt improv. <laughs> Yeah, there is a really sweet spot of time for Chris Pratt to be a movie star. I feel like that ship has kind of sailed personally. You've always been a fan, though, right? Of what, Chris Pratt? Yeah. 
I mean, like his his whole like movie star blow up because we both love him in Parks and Rec. Like he's the best part of it. But then like I know it was a little controversial when he was like, now I'm gonna lose all this weight and be a movie star. And people are like, but like you were so good in doing what you were doing. And that kind of goes to our original point of like James Gunn didn't even need him to lose all the weight and bulk up, but he wanted to. Right. But it does it does feel like it's almost like a whole evolution of of a career. Um, do do I you mean, like the more movie star Pratt, or do you prefer him as the more dweeby kind of? Just dad bod. <laughs> you well, know? Here, here, here's the thing, Dill. I feel like ever since he's made his transformation to the film, you know, fear, I feel like he's kind of really been one note. And I right. feel like if he, if he stuck around, if he stuck, if he stuck around in TV for a little bit longer, I think he would have like adapted more characters, found mm. more different like assets of himself to express um, because I think that he could have went from doing Andy Dwyer to, you know, some other kind of maybe more comedic, maybe more serious character right. in a television show and really found himself that way. Right. But, and I think there's you know, even a world where what? he could still look like this and have the body, right. but also still play the funny roles. And, and that's kind of what Star-Lord is to an extent. But I feel like with each progressing film, he gets less and less like he's not the comedic relief. The others mm-hmm. are he's still like the most straight man of them. Um right, for sure. You know, and, and I feel like, you know, Groot and Drax are the comedic reliefs to him, where mm-hmm. I don't know. I've always preferred the fun, you know, Chris Pratt from Parks and Rec. But um and I think it's interesting because when he wants to kind of take on a more character role, it's always animated. It's Mario, it's Garfield, right. it's like, you know, That's you can do mean. it animated, but, but also, on live action you have to be the the strong guy, you know. I just think in the great. last, you know, he, I mean, the, I'm really commenting on like a place that has really nothing to do with his body and, and the yeah. work that he did to achieve just this the look. style of character. Yeah. Like, exactly. Like, I feel like he's just been doing the same role over and over oh, and over okay. again. And also in the last 10 years, like we've just gotten a lot of Chris Pratt. Like, I think yeah, we need a good, like, 10-year break. You know what I mean? Ten year. Well, I mean, that's kind of what people said about Jennifer Lawrence. She took the time off, and then she came back mm-hmm. with a big sucker punch with... I mean, she was in Don't Look Up, but, you know, that was on Netflix. Only, like, 10 people watched it. And then, like, you know, she really had the yeah. big blow-up with no hard feelings. And I think it was such a refreshing return to form, because it was not only the return of Jennifer Lawrence, who had been in so many movies, and then when The Hunger Games ended, she kind of took a big break. But it was also the first time we had seen her do something so different. And I think if Chris Pratt were to take like even a five year break and then come back with like a real just like flat out comedy, mm-hmm. not the lead, but being like the supporting role in a comedy, I think it would like maybe make a a, a Pratissance in a way. But I think, yeah, yeah. Everyone's bored because him in this film, him in Jurassic World and him in like Passengers are all pretty much the same um in terms of mm-hmm. just the style. He this one's a little funnier. Um, but even then, like as I said, like the third film. Star Lord's not that funny, you know. Um, he's kind of the worst part of the, the next two films, you know. Can I just say we've we've just gotten two really really iconic scenes in this movie, right? It's the scene when they're all captured by the Nova Corps, and we're seeing them mm-hmm. kind of behind the jail cells. John C. Riley is doing a good job of explaining their past, and then we just got the hook John and the feeling drop with yes. them and the montage of them, you know entering the kiln in the prison oh. and James Rude. Gunn is just boy. really Look an at expert at sh- showing and not telling yeah, like the just moment, that, especially. that yeah. really subtle moment with rocket where he just like takes off his coat and you right. see all of the like experimentation that has been done well, yeah. on him you know it's, it's kind of like that toy story scene where woody's you know he's a normal toy but then when he meets all those other like hybrid toys and they step out of the shadows it's like whoa like mm-hmm. you've been through some mm-hmm. shit and that's kind of what this is too it's like chris pratt being like oh it's not a raccoon he's like been through some shit and then we see that right. shit in guardians 3 i think watching this in a post guardians 3 world is so fascinating because i think just so yeah. much more of the rocket backstory is evident without words here just knowing that which I think is really fascinating. And honestly, Gamora as well, knowing her stuff with Thanos. Mm-hmm. Now knowing who Thanos is. Because at this point, we don't really know who Thanos is. He's not really a, 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 an entity right now that we are really concerned about. Now mm-hmm. knowing the whole arc she's gone on and her past and her backstory too makes these moments more haunting, you know? I really mm-hmm. think this is a movie that's only benefited with time in, a, in an interesting way that even though I prefer the next few movies, I still think this one maybe has aged the best because of what came after it, if that makes sense. 
And even this shot of there draft, like yeah. we just zoomed out of Gamora's jail cell to where he was sitting. And we just know that this guy has, you know, something. nothing good planned for her. Right. Yes. I was going to say and something. He, and he her. did He's that all like, just yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And he did this all without words. Mm hmm. And like, obviously, he's going to fill in the blanks later, but it's yeah. just like the tone he sets right off the bat with with each character we have met so far in this film. I love how Rocket was sleeping on his side and he kind of has his first kind of. Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. Kind of smushed in. Mm -hmm. Also, what an awful way to sleep. They were all basically on the floor, just like a bunch of tangled limbs together. Yeah. I can't think of a worse way to sleep. And again, another great pivot here where he comes in you think drax is this like really menacing really mm -hmm. scary figure, and then you realize <laughs> you know it's drax right <laughs> oh that he takes takes everything literally it's funny too because like oh my god reading all the the stuff that he had to go through he went through more than any other character in terms of like the prep like he spent five hours daily in makeup that is crazy. Like getting the makeup put on five hours. Like you're literally spending a third of your day mm -hmm. in makeup, which I guess, you know, that's why they pay them the big bucks, but it's also like, right. it's crazy. I, I, I think that takes an incredible amount of patience. I can't even go for a 30 minute car ride without me getting bored of the podcast I'm listening to. You know, I have to, which says something badly about me as a podcaster. I'm like, wow, how, how would other, how would I feel if other people said that about me? But no, it really is one of those things where I'm like, I can't even do a long road trip without being like, all right, you know, I need to keep myself entertained. I'm bored. And he's sitting right. in a makeup trailer five hours a day. Whew. I mean, I guess when you get like a Marvel movie deal, you, you're willing to spend as many hours as it takes. Right. In, yeah. The in money the really. Makes I mean, that doesn't make it any easier, but. All right. Well, I'm going to make it even harder. Chris Pratt revealed that during the process, Batista stood the entire time stood the entire time with his hands holding onto the rails, which had tennis balls on them with no, so a little bit of squish squish with no complaints yeah. whatsoever. Eventually squish, the process squish. was narrowed down to an average of three hours while 90 minutes were required to remove the makeup. Dude. Yeah. They must have, I, I hope they like put on the makeup and then did like three days of filming and then let him take it off. Like daily. That's, that's at least three hours a day just for makeup. I, I mean, you're, what's you're he gonna do? Sleep in it? But... He's gonna have to take it off at the end of every day. Right. It just it's just impressive. And and honestly, I prefer that as opposed to like the CGI mask in Thor Love and Thunder, you know, like I like the practical. I don't like when mm -hmm. everything's CGI, you know. Yeah, him and Gamora are both practical right now. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Gamora as well. I, I didn't get any stats on how long her makeup took, but I believe because it's just one base color, it's probably less. Um, but she does have the little right. nuances, you know. Yeah, she um, has like details around her eyes, and yeah. I, I, I would guess hers maybe took like an hour. You know, maybe it started at two or three and then narrowed down to one or something. Mm -hmm. um, did you know that in the comics, Drax is actually green, but the film was oh. changed to a muddier gray, partly because the movie already had a bright green character like Gamora, and they didn't want to confuse mm -hmm. the two, even though I don't know how you can confuse the two. But most importantly, they wanted to distinguish his appearance from the Hulk, because eventually the whole plan of mm. like when they all came together, they didn't want it to be like this big green guy and then this bigger green guy. You know, they wanted to yeah. have their own individual stances, which I really like the the design of Drax in this. Like I think they they find the right colors to pop. He still has those really bright blue eyes. Um, I, I think it's a good design. It gets a little lost sometimes in the darker scenes, but I think it aids in the comedy of some of the darker scenes, like Infinity War, when he's like invisible eating the chips. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. where the design of Drax almost being this camouflage gray is is really funny. So, and again, Bradley Cooper just so good as as Rocket here. Mm hmm. Really, really fantastic performance. Yeah, which which is surprising because at, at the time I feel like he was like really rising and and it, and you wouldn't think that he would just take like a voice role in a Marvel movie, but maybe because it's just a voice role in a Marvel movie, maybe he felt like he had the time and he wanted to work with Gunn. But like an actor at his caliber at that point, because he had been nominated for American Hustler and uh, he was just about to do American Sniper and he had just done Silver Lang's Playbook. Like he's he's at the mm -hmm. peak. You know, the Hangover movies mm -hmm. were just wrapping up, so. Is this our first uh, Daddy T appearance? Or is he not in this scene? I forget. 
Is that him sitting up there? No, I think he's there. Okay. Does he speak here or, or no? No, he does because he says something to Nebula and she's like, thanks, dad. Gotcha. And then like walks away. So so remind me, up till now, we have met Thanos before. We have seen Thanos, but we haven't. This we've, is Josh Brolin's first. We've seen Thanos at the end of the Avengers. Right. But this is the first time we're seeing Josh Brolin and we're really seeing him like speak. I honestly wish I had like been more into the comic lore when this came out because I feel like this mm -hmm. moment probably made people go nuts, right? I mean, I imagine. We, we, the interesting thing is neither of us saw this in theaters, so like we we don't have the, you know, the knowledge of what the audience's reaction was to this as opposed to like the Garfield re reveal in in No Way Home, you know? Right. But I I imagine when he turns around, everyone just kind of goes nuts, right? Right. Yeah, probably. Or were they not back in 2014, like the caliber that they were in, you know, 2019 when we were watching yeah. Endgame? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, Thanos is still such a big part of the comics. I feel like people had to have known, at least the diehard fans had to have known who he was and what this would mean for the because because they've also been collecting the Infinity Stones for the past few films. So, like, it's been mm -hmm. building to that for sure. <laughs> and it starts the obsession with the leg. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love how Groot doesn't have to wear any sort of like prison garb. <laughs> yeah. They're like, nah, he's he's too tall. <laughs> he's a good boy. Yeah. He's just such a good boy. He's such a good boy. He deserves all the treats. All the what? Treats like a dog, like how you give. I oh, know, okay. well, because he dog. is a tree. I wanted to make sure you weren't talking like he deserves more trees. Oh no! Oh, I love the uh, the dunk on the head. Oh, yeah, this is a very Groot thing of just like while the plan's being explained, Groot's already doing it and finishing it. Right, like he's just because he thinks he's doing the right thing. He's just. Like, I love how oh, Drax is just standing there. Get a big battery. Out. I'm on it. Yeah. And this is I'll get the really arm band leg. See. This is where we're going to start to see the come the coming together, which I think is important. You know, these really remind me of the drones that Tony Stark has, and that we see mm -hmm. in Spider-Man Two: Far From Home. Yeah. Oh yeah. The you projections. I mean? It and is now very interesting. Threatening Groot. Oh, but he don't care. I think this is definitely the most like menacing and powerful he's felt. You know. Yeah. Obviously, little Groot's not, but even the the new, the jock juiced Groot. up Groot. Yeah. The Groot on steroids from well now from he's like Guardians three. He's huge now in the post credits yeah. of Guardians three. He's even bigger. And I love how Rocket still runs like a raccoon. Uh huh. Just such a good design. Also, great CGI on Rocket. Like that's something that I think we don't even realize. Like, yeah, how seriously. well detailed that is. Like Groot's not real. No, like I have to remind well myself of that. Yeah, I I always have to remind myself that Zoe Saldana looks how she looks because every movie I see her in, she's either a blue Navi or she's a green Gamora. You know, mm -hmm. she's in Star Trek, but like that's still all otherworldly. Where I'm like, is that even really her? Um, yeah, she's great. I did find a, a tidbit about her makeup uh, experience. She didn't talk about how long it took to get the makeup, but she did say that she was the one who fought for herself to do it through makeup. Originally, there was talk about maybe we would make her a CGI character or performance capture, which is what she did for Avatar, um, which mm -hmm. we would see with a few roles, um, Thanos especially. Um, but she said no. She said I want to just do it in makeup, and they said sure. Here's a little bit of extra money to sit in a chair for three more hours of your time. And uh, have that a that moment's a great use of juxtaposition between Rocket and Groot violently mm -hmm. like shooting at all the drones attacking them to just the quick cut of Star Lord trying to get the leg from the guy and saying, <laughs> yeah. and him just going, "You need my what?" Yeah, it's just like these the way that comedy is integrated into th these moments is just so. Yeah. 
so brilliant. I, if there is one mind that I would ever just want to pick and just ask anything to, it is James Gunn. I just want like an eighth of his brilliance. It sucks because like if I ever or you ever get big enough to like get like some heavy hitting guests on the show, we could not have James Gunn on this show because now he's going to be in association with DC. So we're going to have to wait till the next April Fool's Day or we'll have to just do a one off <laughs> just talking about just his whole director process and psyche with him. Right. Um, I'd love to have James Gunn on the show. James, if you're listening, which I know you are. Um, of course. Please come on. Please, please come on the show. We'd love to pick your brain. Hell, we'll watch this movie again. Do another commentary with you. Mm hmm. Oh, a director's commentary, go. which I, I think might exist somewhere. A lot of directors do commentaries for their own movie, as they should. I think it's really cool whether or not you interpret the films the same as the director. David Lynch always said this great anecdote that he's like, once I make the film, it's not about what I think. It's it's all about what the audience interprets it. Like it's whatever mm -hmm. they want to interpret it is it's their film now, which I agree with. But I also think there's something cool to be said about like hearing the director's original intention at least of what they were going for and like what they wanted to get across even if you know it is in the audience's hands now <laughs> i just love how drax just calls like the hottest women in the world ugly and foul like zoe saldana top five most beautiful women ever exist mm -hmm. and like come on and even Mantis and Guardians too. He's like, you're disgusting yeah. looking. And it's like, no, she's not. Mantis no. is kind of cute. You watch Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning and tell me that Palm Clementif is not one of the most just charismatic, effervescent human beings ever. And that's in a movie with like Vanessa Kirby and Michelle mm. or and Rebecca Ferguson. And I almost said Michelle Monaghan. She's in the other ones. Uh, and who, who else? Oh, and Haley Atwell. Like, She's in good company, and she's still just like mm -hmm. was badass. <laughs> My reflexes are too fast. I would catch it. Yeah, underrated. I think at the time when this came out, I think a lot of people were buzzing about Pratt, obviously because it was a very different pivot. I think people obviously love Groot and Rocket because they're also like the CGI characters, and it's the big celebrities voicing them. Zoe mm -hmm. Saldana being like the girl of the team. I feel like Drax is the one who was talked about the least at the time. But I think mm -hmm. with time, I think he's kind of garnered more of that fan base because he's my favorite of the five for sure. He's my yeah. He's you have you you have mentioned that once or twice still, <laughs> <laughs> or like a billion times. I love Drax, but even now, I like I think he's underrated in this film or underutilized even. Like I think they didn't want to lay it all on us at first. Mm -hmm. They want to kind of pepper him in like a really nice seasoning in like a soup rather than like seizing a whole steak with it you know it's the best analogy i can make this is very fun when they uh mm. turn off the gravity yeah and again looks so real as as much as we know it's fake the visual effects are great like i i know it's not interstellar and i wouldn't have ever given this the award over that but like it's a great nomination i think because it doesn't look messy it still looks in a way controlled and Yes. Uniform. Does that make sense? I would say this is probably out of the three Guardians films, the ones where we get the least amount of color, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh, I'm yeah. looking at all of, like the all vibrancy. Of, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at, I'm just watching all these sequences and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is a lot of gray for a James yeah. Gunn project. It is. And it's very muted. But the thing is, I think there's still a good amount of contrast. Like they're wearing mm -hmm. yellow with the gray and they have colorful, yeah. you know, characters. Gamora herself is colorful. And I think also they give us enough flashes of like, you know, these blues here and the yellows to kind of offset. Like, I think he's still a very mindful filmmaker in that sense. But I agree. I think it's visually probably the least dynamic, I would say, of the three. I mean, this third one's just so beautiful. And the second one with the funeral scene and the Pac-Man, like there's just so many visually mm -hmm. dazzling things, you know. So mm -hmm. I think it only got better. Yeah, very, very dark. The Milano. The Milano. Alyssa Milano. I'm not going to finish that song because it's inappropriate. Um, all right, you want another uh, James Gunn fun fact? He's a big... Uh, let me ask you first, Kels. What's your love language? 
like the one that I give or the one that I like to receive? Both, both. Um, I think the one that I give is probably like acts of service. Mm-hmm. And the one that I like the most are words of affirmation. Tells you you're a great co-host. Um, oh, man, so, thank you, <laughs> James Gunn's favorite to at least give is gifts. He loves giving gifts. And this is something I found mm-hmm. a lot of in my trivia. Um, loves giving gifts. During a shoot, uh, whenever he would, he would always carry like piles of little Play-Doh containers around in his bag. Okay. And whenever, whenever the day wrapped, he would always give out a little Play-Doh con- container to someone who he felt did a really exceptional job that day, whether it be a stuntman, a grip, an actor, you know, uh, an editor, anything. He would have the little Play-Dohs. Um, and he says he would give out, he gave out 40 containers over the entire shoot on an 85-day shoot. So not every day. Some days didn't warrant them, I guess. Um, but he says, I love the smell of Play-Doh. Opening a new container and smelling it puts me in a creative, childlike place. And who doesn't love playing with Play-Doh? So, love Kelsey, it. whenever you get lucky enough to be on a James Gunn set, you will have to let us know what color you get, what color Play-Doh you get, oh my and God. how it smells. To be gifted <laughs> some Play-Doh from James Gunn, I think I would die. I think you'd have to imagine, resurrect me back yeah, to life. Imagine just Michael Rooker pulling out the Mary Poppins line, and he's like, there's your play doh <laughs> you know like be nuts who do you think got the play doh for this movie like if you had to give an mvp i know mm. we're not done with it we're we're not even halfway but who who is like who who is the mvp of the first film for you like who whose film do you think oh who, who god that's it? such a good question dill i mean character wise it's screwed i think but like performance wise like who would get your gold star your play doh I want to say that he either gave a Play-Doh, and he could have given it to both. He probably gave it to all of them at, at some point, but... Right. I'm... Well, I'm I'm hoping that his brother, Sean, got a Play-Doh because oh, yeah. he is the onset Groot, and so he's, like, yeah. crunched all day. He's squatting all day to be the same level as... No, I'm sorry. Not, ro- not yeah. Groot Rocket. Yes. Yeah. Um, and also I, I just think, I don't know why this is so funny in my head, but to like, just give Glenn Close some Play-Doh, I'm like, I hope she got one too. He's like, you've never won an Oscar and you n- probably never will, but like, here you go. Uh, cause she's the most nominated actress without an Oscar and everyone thought she was going to get it for the wife in 2018 and then Olivia Coleman got it. And everyone's like, I don't know when she's going to get it now because she's had so many chances. Um, oh my God. That's crazy. I do think she just got cast in the new Knives Out movie, so maybe there's a juicy supporting role for her to get a nomination and possibly a win for. She also is going to be playing uh, Norma Desmond in the musical adaptation of Sunset Boulevard. They're doing a film mm. based on the musical, which is already based on a film. So I think those are her two best shots. But after that, Damn. I don't know if we're going to get Glenn that Oscar. She might come close <laughs> several times, but oh. I don't know. I do not um, see foresee an Oscar right now for her in her career. Um yeah, it'd be fun if on the day he's like, Glenn, John, John C. Riley, here you go. Here's some Play-Doh. Back over here. Sorry, I'm moving around a lot just because I'm you're trying good. to get comfy in my bed. It's funny because I, I can tell when you're not as talkative, it's because not because you're tired or you're zoning out. It's because you're just fully invested because you love this film so much. And you're just like, yeah, in. you know, <laughs> I, I see you like intently watching and I'm like, there, there's some magic of this movie. You know, it is just endlessly rewatchable and entertaining. Um. More gifts. He gives post rap gifts as well. Um, do you want to know it. what he got? What he, what he got, Dave uh, Batista? I do know what he got, Dave Batista. Did you just because... read it? No, I remember hearing about this because he okay. has like a he has a very like a lunchbox collection, yes. collection it's, or something. It's a vintage lunchbox uh, collection. So what was yeah. on the lunchbox? Was it, it was a Drax like... lunchbox. So he oh, either okay. created or had created or physically found a uh, Drax lunchbox to give him for his collection. What do you think he gave Chris Pratt and Zoe Saldana? Who both are apparently big fans of this thing. Oh, God. of Oh, of the same thing? They, he got them each the same thing, or they're they're custom to them, but custom made 
two 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 important things that um I guess they're big fans of this sport. That could be a hint. Jerseys? No, very close though. You do wear them. I'll give you a hint. It falls more in our trivia stuff than it does in like normal sports. A no. belt? Yes, he actually custom had them uh, custom made two WWE championship belts for Chris Pratt and Zoe Saldana. They must be big WWE fans. Very James Gunn got those? Yeah. I he feel like those would have those would have come from Chris. Dave Patissa because it wasn't true, Dave Patissa the the wrestler? True. You know that would make a lot of sense, but so Chris and Zoe Am must I been wrong huge assuming that fans. he is a wrestler, right? Yes, yes. Yes, and, right. and honestly he kind of helped indoctrinate this like surge of really great, you know, wrestler turned actor performances. Specifically, you know, the big 3 we talk about are The Rock, John Cena, and Dave Bautista. Like those are the big 3 right now in cinema that are just really showing that they can hold their own cuz you know, their style of wrestling is a very performative, you know. Um mm, mm-hmm, sport, mm-hmm. but I love the design of Nowhere by the way, the big head. Mm-hmm. Just so creative, and I know that's a comics thing, but it's just the design and actual like visual, visual. Oh, I can't speak. Visualization of it is so good. And also, Dill, just in general, I love the atmosphere of space in this movie. It just seems very like outlawy, like kind of like yeah, like almost like you're on the outskirts of like a really like hard boiled. It's almost got a noir feeling to it. The, the city, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's almost a little grimy. Exactly. It's like they scummy. all kind of come from pockets of like really like like these grungy areas of space almost. Yeah. Like it's not Las Vegas or you know um what's the really nice place in Crazy Rich Asians? Is that Singapore? Um Oh god, I I, I just watched but, but like a lot of those too. like big those big vibrant Asian cities. It's not that. It's this is like Newark and you know um I'm trying to think of other really um, Well, I'm things. like, well, you were like making me think of like vacation spots in my in my head. I went, oh, like Seaside Heights. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, if you're I on mean, the Jersey no, Shore, <laughs> if, if it had like skyscrapers and stuff. But you know, this is right. very much like this is honestly like a lot of like U.S. cities as opposed to like you know more international, beautiful like Tokyo. You know, which I know is right, very clean right. and very you know well preserved. Oh, I love Groot's little smile during this section. His little laugh. Yeah. Oh, oh, and then he's immediately <laughs> horrified. Afraid. And this again adds to the atmosphere because this film, if you think about it, not a lot happens in terms of like action and like plot. It's a lot more about like the jo- general atmosphere and connection of the characters, which I really like. And I guess that's the same for all the movies. Like the second one is all about the father son relationship. The third one is all about Rocket and this team unity. It has a little bit more of a plot because of you know racing to see to save him. But like these movies are not about their stories, and that's what's so amazing mm-hmm. about them. It's all about the connections and the themes and the relationships. You know, like this one especially. Ugh. it hurts even look more. Look at this. Like also, Dill. Look at the sky behind them right now. Like it's mm-hmm. so full of texture and depth and color right. mm-hmm. like it's not there there's just detail in everything that these movies do yeah like i mean there's even something like flickering behind gamora in this mm-hmm. shot and it's like kind of like sparking and right. you see the embers falling behind her like everything is just so like alive and happening around yeah. them well especially because it's alive but it's also in a way broken it's not clean if that makes mm-hmm. sense like there's yes. still a dirtiness because that is like the whole crux of the character. That's the whole crux of this conversation here is that they both come from these backgrounds that are very tortured and very, you know, they're sharing those experiences right now. He's talking about his earth and, and, you know, she with Thanos. I mean, oh, that shot is so good. Just the <gasps> this shot is so beautiful. Gorgeous. Um, like look I, at I that sky. Yeah. I prefer a little bit more light on them in terms of just the composition. But again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be, uh, I'm not going to be like I was on Winter Soldier talking about how shittily, lit every scene is um yeah, I think the, yeah, lighting, yeah. the lighting i think james gunn is just such a better filmmaker than the russos that like the general composition is really just fully well conceived and well analyzed and thought out even here like just the way her face is illuminated is, is really special so i like it 
So what were you thinking, Dill, when you first watched this movie? Did you want these two to get together? Or were you like, uh, ah, no, don't force it. It's like too... <laughs> I think honestly, the the way this society has unfortunately made us so like heteronormative, like oh, the leading man and leading woman have to fall in love. I always just kind mm-hmm. of accepted it. It wasn't like one of those oh, I want them to get together versus I don't. It's more like okay, they're the two leads; they're going to get together. Um, sure. You know, which is obviously contradictory to Star Wars, where it was the supporting guy and girl instead of Luke and Leia because they were siblings. But you know, it, it's mm. I, I I do think I just always kind of accepted it. To where I I do mm-hmm. I do miss it in Guardians Three, even though I think they make a really good statement about the idea of like her having her own identity and stuff. Like I I, I like that. Um, Infinity War pisses me off, but it's because I'm invested in them. Um, mm-hmm. They have one of the more interesting relationships in the MCU, and I, I do think I go up and down with them. But at the time watching this, I remember I I, I dug it. Um, right. Yeah. Honestly. Honestly. Yeah. And also, there's no other people to ship him with yet. You know, like we haven't met Mantis, we haven't met Nebula. Or there's or we have but she's not like a team member um mm-hmm. to where it's like she's really the only option and like you the audience always sees yourself in those two more than you see yourself in like drax or rocket or Groot, just based on the physical appearances too it's like mm-hmm. most people watching this movie were like oh if i'm star lord you know that's who i would be attracted to type deal um but i don't know maybe people have kinks and they're like rocket though <laughs> But not me. (laughs) Not me. Not me. As I said, not me. The only thing that I really like about Peter Quill and Gamora is that they are complete opposites. Right. In the fact that, you know, she's this more like stoic, very serious type of like literally trained assassin. I need to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of more like, no, let's throw in some music. Let's vibe a little, like have Mm -hmm. some fun. And so they kind of really balance each other out really well. They balance each other out in personality types. But I also think there's something to be said about their story still being so close in the fact that like a lot of their trauma stems from their families. Not Mm -hmm. necessarily the same way though. Pratt, it's or Pratt, Starler Quill. It's more of an absentee thing where it's like he never had his mother growing up in his teenage years, and he was raised by these ravagers. Whereas Gamora, it's 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 the opposite. She wishes she could get away, probably from her father, um, mm-hmm. but she was also, as we learned in Infinity War, stripped away from her family. Um, so I think it's just very interesting. There are these adopted kind of lost souls on a highway to nowhere that they don't really know where they're going. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably the one complaint is it's it's a little too male dominant this film, where it's like yeah. a, a woman enters and you're like oh a girl, um, just because right, it's like right. where, where, where oh. The, oh there's Cosmo she she's a good girl, Cosmo. Is this where we see Howard the Duck as well? I don't think we see him until the very end, but we might see him. I feel like he's like hidden in this collection somewhere. Like okay, is it me or right? Okay, there was a I don't think okay, right over the collector's shoulder, there's like a guy standing in a very fog, foggy mm-hmm. glass box. And for a second it really looked like he had Wolverine claws. I don't know. Maybe I mean that could also just be like an Easter egg. Like they maybe try to want to make you deceive it it want to deceive you in that way, but Right. God. I could also, I just have, I might also just have like X Men on the brain and might just be seeing things. You know what I mean? Mm. (laughs) Benicio del Toro is such an interesting person because, like, I Mm -hmm. feel like all his actors, all his performances, they're they're simultaneously really kind of quirky and funny and energetic while also being the most tired person you've ever seen <laughs> like mm. like needs, okay. needs a fucking nap or just woke up from a nap but still has like that moment where he like gets on his toes to look at Groot and he's like hello sir I'm like you know th- that kind of stuff where I'm like right he's, so, he's such a fucking goofball oh. but he's also so tired sorry Quill almost <laughs> wait, dropped the ore. Wait, wait, wait. What is that moment? What is he doing there? What did Drax just do? I don't. I think maybe there was a bug sparks? flying around, oh, okay. and he was. I thought it was the sparks. Or maybe the sparks. I don't know. He was trying always, to like you know not catch on fire in I've that always moment. Wondered, I've always wondered, and I was hoping you would answer it for me. I don't know. Sorry, I was too distracted by the fact that you know there's that infamous moment where. Peter Quill goes to present the orb and he almost drops Drop it. And it. apparently that is a serious outtake where Chris Pratt himself 
accidentally almost just dropped it and then saves it and they kept it in. And then this is where we really get an in-depth, you know, explanation yeah. of what all of the Infinity Stones are. Oh, look, that looks like Arishim from yeah, it does. Eternals. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, it's very interesting because I, I, I want to I almost want to pick the brains of the production as well for this, like Kevin Feige's brain, which I've never said that before. But I guess mm -hmm. in this instance, I'd like to sit down and talk with Kevin Feige. But I also I want to know, did they think they had a hit on their hands and were that's why they were confident enough to release it in theaters or because everyone, from what I remember, thought this film was going to fail. They're like, it's characters no one knows about from very obscure comics. How could this succeed when like Captain America and like the X-Men movies and Spider-Man, like the Guardians were never that. So I think a lot of people expected this film to fail. But mm -hmm. then I'm thinking the producers must have known what what gold they have had on their hands and knew it was probably going to be a hit. And, and, well, it, and I'm, I'm a little more convinced of that because they're putting so much of the MCU lore in this film that I forgot was even there. We're like they're introducing Thanos in this film. They're introducing the Kree. They're introducing the Infinity Stones concept. They're introducing mm -hmm. so much that it almost makes me think they had to have known this was going to be a breakout hit. Because what if you stuff it with all this lore and then it ends up being kind of what like Eternals was in terms of box office, where it's like people saw it, came and saw it and, and it went and it wasn't really making the impact. Like what? Mm -hmm. There's always that fear just with very obscure characters, or did they just have that much confidence because it was MCU that they would? You know, pull well, it you know, Dill, I'm going to say back in 2014, like that was really when the MCU was like kind of at like a peak or definitely towards the incline right. of heading towards the peak. Right. Because right. That was Infinity the War peak. or not Infinity War. Age of Ultron was about to come out. Avengers had come out two years prior. So we were in that middle right. ground of like, we know another one's coming. We knew we just had this big one. And like, this is like the lead up between those, the linking. Honestly, stuff. they were probably feeling rather confident and borderline i'm gonna say a little cocky off of the you know success of the avengers and they were probably just thinking to themselves like anything we put out like people are gonna go see yeah. and mm -hmm. we know that we're building this complex universe and that you know i think that any movie is a gamble for sure but yeah. i think that they really thought they were gonna have something special yeah. here especially with the star power of Chris Pratt, you know, right. leading this one. Yeah. And I remember I watched a lot of, like, I had, I had seen every Marvel movie up until Avengers Age of Ultron. And I remember I actually watched Age of Ultron on a plane, I believe, um, mm. for the first time, which is a very interesting way to Big watch it. Big plane but, movie. Yeah. But I, I do remember after that, not really being totally into the lore, more so being like, okay, I've seen all the movies. I'm good. But then when it was Civil War that really kind of got me in the, in the mindset of like, oh, I want to actually like watch these again and like really focus on the the inroads because now they're going to be fighting and like what does that mean for for it and now oh ant-man is now in this one so now you're connecting that one like i i didn't even really grasp the overall big picture yet at, at 2014 i think it was more like 2016 which was like senior year of high school going into college um where i kind of grasped that but i, I just think it's very interesting because like yeah at the time i'm wondering how many people watched this as just a one-off but also how many people may have dismissed this because they're like i don't know who these characters are this seems stupid this seems like whatever um mm -hmm. and then missed a lot of the lore because of that but like you said like i mean iron man 3 wasn't well received but made a shit ton of money you know thor the mm -hmm. dark world not well received made a lot of money um or at least enough money <laughs> you know um mm -hmm. and captain america winter soldier made got good reviews even though it didn't get the big money they, they thought it was so yeah i agree with you they're at a peak where they feel like Honestly, this is the best time to release something like this that was a little bit more niche characters you didn't know about because you are now riding your high to where if it does fail, okay. But if it succeeds, we're already hitting a hot streak. This is the right time to strike. It's almost like striking when the, what is the phrase? When the thing is hot or whatever. Striking when the iron is hot. Yeah, I think that's exactly what this was. If you wait five more years to do this, like after Civil War, maybe it isn't successful. If you do this before the Avengers, this is by no means successful. I think they came out, mm -hmm. they put it out at the right time where there was enough interest for casuals because of the MCU to get in on it. And then the hardcore MCU fans were willing to accept it because, you know, it's a cool new property that they hadn't seen on film before. Even the colors in this are so good because there's a lot of grays and, and muddiness, but there's so much color popping in and out throughout, mm -hmm. you know, just from the neon signs around and the explosions. And 
honestly, Jill, when I first saw this movie, like this moment and this whole sequence really made me dislike Drax. And I think that's what keeps him from being, you know, one of my favorites out of the Guardians because Mm. his biggest character flaw is this. It's like it's biting off more than he can chew. It's taking on more than he thinks he can handle. Mm. Like he literally called Ronan to nowhere because he was like, I... This is why I'm here. I want to kill this guy for killing my yeah. family. And at the end of the day, he just puts all of them through danger and it and is the reason why the Guardians like get split up for, you know, mm. this in, yeah. until Act 3 hits, you know what I mean? I feel like that that's what we see in a lot of like just revenge films in general. It's like you what would you do to get revenge? How far would you go? And sometimes it's you cross that line. And it's like you would literally not think of the logical steps if it just means getting in front of that person that you want to kill you know Mm -hmm. um i just watched for the retrospective actually a movie called blue ruin have you ever seen blue ruin Mm -mm. i actually think you would like it it's it's a very good movie but it's about a guy who who's the murderer of his parents is released from jail 10 years after the murder and he basically makes it his quest to kill the guy who killed his parents Mm -hmm. but in doing so he doesn't realize that now you're involving your family, your your uh, sister and her kids. You're involving his family. You're involving a lot more than than you think you are by just merely going after someone who killed your family. Now, when you mm-hmm. get even, they want to get even again. And and I think that's the thing with Drax too. He's just so narrow minded. But I think that adds a lot right. to his evolution with time. But I suggest Blue Ruin. This is actually the second time I've talked about Blue Ruin today because I recorded with Matt earlier and we talked about Blue Ruin. So it must just so be fresh funny. on the mind. It must be influential in that way. Right. Kelsey, I don't know if it's because I'm talking with a big diehard Guardians fan here, but I'm enjoying this much more than I thought I would on rewatch. Because I always oh, really like I like this film a lot, but I was always like the second one's just my favorite. It's my favorite MCU movie, and then the third one's like just such a great capper that I've just never really right. treated this one on the same level. And I still think this is the least my least favorite of three, at least so far. But like I don't know, just hearing the little things. This one really holds up for me, Dill. I think that this one is still my favorite to this day. I think that my ranking would have to go Guardians 1, Guardians 3, Guardians 2. And I know that must... (laughs) Yeah, literally. (laughs) But they're all great. I think we all say... That was a great shot of this ship exploding kind of in slow-mo. Yeah, and and in little tiny little pieces, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we really see this moment of like oh. Star Lord is ready to risk it all to save this woman he's just. And this met. is also and, and again the orbs there too. So it's like what yeah. do you save? The there world goes your, your the orb, rockets there, Groot's there, and he's like, No, yeah, I have to go save Gamora. And it's a great mirror to what would happen with him later with Adam in three. Mm-hmm. This this whole imagery of him just like in the abyss of space. Oh, it's just such a well-made film. Not the last time we're going to see Drax in a bunch of yellow goo. And I am referring <laughs> to when he is inside of the monster they're fighting at the beginning of Guardians 2. When he's trying to claw himself mm-hmm. from the outside hey. in. He's just a regular old Winnie inside the Inside out. <laughs> he reminds me of Winnie the Pooh. He would like just jump into the honey tree. Yeah. And I'm like, you were... You, but you're going to have a tough time showering the honey out of your fur. I don't even know yeah. if Winnie the Pooh had a shower. Maya, if you're listening, tell me, did Winnie the Pooh have a shower? God, I hope he did. He doesn't wear pants. So I don't know what that says about showering. That's going to be a five pointer someday. What are his coordinates? <laughs> 227K. You know, and, and honestly, we can sit here and say that Peter Quill is the straight man in this group all that we want and like yeah at the end of the day he probably is but he also teaches each of the guardians a very valuable lesson of being selfless because Mm -hmm. they start this journey you know thinking me first like every man for himself i have to look after me because no one else will and this moment of sacrifice he has especially in front of rocket is like I feel a huge deal to the character arc of like all of them because even when 
him and Gamora end up in the Ravager ship together, she like can't believe it. She's like, oh my God, like wh what did you do? Like, where's the orb? You you chose to save me instead of the orb? Like you're nuts. Mm -hmm. And I just think that it's point. you know, this is start this is the catalyst that starts each of the Guardians' journeys into, you know being a found family and for not just right. looking after themselves, but each other. Mm -hmm. Speaking of this beautiful romance we have, I read another fun fact. I feel like this is a good time for it. Um, yeah. While they just almost killed themselves uh, in this scene. Um, Zoe Saldana <laughs> and uh, Chris Pratt would wear protective gear when they were doing their fight sequences. So they would obviously, you know, be able to do full force hits on one another when they had to hit, mm. which was obviously earlier on when they were fighting. They don't do much of it later on the film, but I should have brought mm -hmm. it up then, but I forgot. Um, one day right. when, when the day actually came to film the scene, Pratt forgot to wear his protective gear, but because he, he didn't want Saldana to, um, you know, hold back. He was like, if I tell her I'm not wearing it, she's going to hold back and it's not going to look convincing. So like, whatever she can just do full out punches it's fine i can handle it i've got this new chiseled six pack i'm good or eight pack or 12 oh my pack, god and she swear to god almost broke his ribs kicked him square in the ribs which made chris pratt fall to the ground according to pratt he had a bruise for the remainder of filming um and if you know if you bruise your ribs that is like purple belly your belly is grimacing um yeah <laughs> Thing. did you see did you see gordon ramsay got in a um a bike accident in connecticut uh he no. was riding his bike and and i don't know exactly what happened if he got hit by a car or another bike or whatever and he said it was it, his post was basically wear a helmet and it's funny because he's he's standing in his chef garb at hell's kitchen and he's like talking about it he's like yeah so like it's important to wear a helmet because like i'm very lucky to be here right now and he's very serious and then he i'm like this does not look like a dude who just got in like a bike accident. Are you sure this mm. is recent? And then he pulls up his chef coat and his whole abdomen is just dark purple. And I'm like, Holy oh my crap. God. Like bruised ribs are no joke. So yeah, Zoe yeah. Saldana bruised Chris Pratt's ribs because he forgot the one day he forgot the protective gears the day they filmed the fight scene. So um, Zoe Saldana does not hold back Chris, Chris Pratt, not necessarily the safety team's uh, biggest uh, fan. Or not the biggest, the safety team's favorite person. Oh my god, I'm I'm just looking at the picture of Gordon Ramsay. Oh my god. Yeah, right? God. Isn't that crazy? It um, literally looks like he got like a tattoo of just like a big purple square. Yes. Yes, it does. It almost looks like, yeah, it almost looks like a, an undershirt <laughs> that's pulled up yeah. a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, there's a before and after picture also of his helmet. His helmet is, like, totally, like, squashed in. Do you see that? It almost looks like the Darth Vader helmet in Force Awakens. Another movie, Kelsey has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I, I don't get that. <laughs> I don't understand that reference. <laughs> I think a fun project would be to just finally watch those movies with you, Kelsey. But I have no time. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> okay. someday. We will someday. But it's just, I, I have no time right now. I'll get around to it eventually. Please do. And and Matt you know is what? dying that's, for me to watch this movie. That's what the TikTok's for. I mean, make make this TikToks and and send them to Dill Pickle Movie Network TikTok and and share your experience watching Star Wars. That is a really really funny moment, Dill. That just happened. When... Yes, I'm sorry. I, I was talking about Gordon Ramsay over it. Please. No, no, go no ahead. you're good. I just want to make sure that we touch on this because it really. I I feel like once you know one too many times you see the same movie like obviously you can recognize like the funny moments in it but very rarely do they actually get a laugh out of you and that moment will always make me laugh just because it's Groot saying oh my god I'm so angry you're making me kick grass <laughs> as he's cr kicking the the little mound of grass and it's just a, it's just very very Groot funny. Groot or Rocket? I keep doing that. It's you rocket. are. I, I think I, it's I'm okay. just. I think I just love Groot so much. I keep wanting to talk about him, okay. but it is very much Rocket. At least you're able to use more than three words in describing what you were feeling. So. Right. Honestly, not a well-written character, but Lee Pace is eating <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. He is. He's no, at he at a buffet. Is. <laughs> he is. He's got a steak and lobster on his plate. He is eating my friend and with that makeup oh, it's so good 
he's very Shakespearean. Um, last mm-hmm. fun fact I have, I might as well rattle it off here because I've only got yeah. one left, which is a very sweet one, actually. As much as we've shat on him uh, in other instances, not today, but in other areas, um, Chris Pratt apparently stole his Star Lord costume from the set for the, for the sole purpose of having it available so he could show up in costume to visit sick children in hospitals. Oh, that's meet very Star-Lord. sweet. Isn't that great? Just breaking your contract just to make kids happy. I think they could forgive it. That's very, very sweet. And he's probably the only one who could do it, because if, like, freaking Dave Batista showed up in his drag stuff, they'd all probably scream <laughs> agony. <laughs> or, like, Yondu. He's like, who's this blue man? Yeah. Was this your first Michael Rooker um, experience? Yes. Interesting. Because I watched him on The the Walking Dead as Merle. Um mm. So it was, it was just really cool to see him in this afterwards, because it's it's a it's a very similar character, but still so different in so many ways. But mm-hmm. I'm a big fan. He loves to scream. He's a screamer. Maybe more like a growler than a screamer. <laughs> There's Sean. Captain's got to teach stuff. It always sounds like he's got something in his mouth, right? Does he have something in his mouth? I think he has like grills. Maybe. But I also think I also think I also think it's a character choice. Right. It's a good character choice. It's it gives like, him a distinct personality. Yeah, it, it cuz like each of the ravagers they just come off like very like uneducated and I think that's the point. It's that mm-hmm. they you know, like this is how they've made their livelihood and Right. You know, have have lived their lives just like in this gang together. Yeah. Just want to say I'm a, a little jealous. Uh, Stacy, a previous um, trivia competitor and champion, mm-hmm. um, met Sean Gunn today, actually, at the Boston. Uh, there's a Boston fan fair, it's called. I, I forget what it's actually called. Uh, Stacy, you can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, because uh, I know you and Carly are going to be watching this because I'm going to make you and Carly watch this because Carly's favorite director is James Gunn and Stacy loves guardians um let me see she also okay Mm -hmm. you're gonna be jealous when i list off all the people she met um here she is right here with sean gunn oh Um, my god that's so sorry cc if i'm if i'm not allowed to show the world that picture but i i just it's so cool i i had to uh it's the boston fan expo it's called the boston fan expo she also met stacy i hope i have your permission to show you this but she met matt murdoch and uh vincent d'onofrio or sorry, Charlie Cox and Vincent D'Onofrio as well. So, very cool day for Stacy. She also ate some fudge. Oh. It looks like she met Rosario Dawson as well, um, Mario Lopez, uh, and Marissa Tomei. Marissa Tomei. That is so so cool. Yeah, we got to do one of those someday. Good for her. Maybe we got to go yeah. up. Stacy, let us know when the next one is. We'll come up to Boston and we'll do it with you. That'd be fun. Yeah. The Yankees are playing the Red Sox this weekend in Boston. Like, I could have gone up, seen the Fan Expo, and then gone to a Red Sox-Yankees game. It would have been great. Yeah. Speaking of, I should check the score and find out if I'm going to have a sad or happy night tonight. <sighs> yeah, they lost 8-4. to four. It's okay. The Red Sox, they needed a win after their pitiful season so far. Damn. Uh, it's okay. It happens. R- Rocket just said he was like, oh... So what? We're gonna give the stone to Yondu, who who will probably sell it to someone who's even worse than Thanos. And like, honestly, is there someone worse than Thanos? <sighs> they don't know. That's I true. think that's that's the kind of stuff that's so fun to watch in retrospect because they're like worse than Thanos. It's like I mean, no. I get building to something worse with I guess whatever Secret Wars is happening, and then of course you know Kang because he's a real life criminal, I guess, but. Not, I guess. I know. Mm-hmm. I am Groot. <laughs> I love it. And then he starts eating a, a <laughs> weed that's growing off of his shoulder. Like, I, come on now. I love that moment because that feels like the moment where Star Lord finally understands him. You know what I mean? Because like they yeah. each I feel like have that one moment where they finally are like understanding of his language. Um, right. 
and then in the last film it's like Gamora 2.0 is the one who's struggling to understand him and finally gets on that page but I feel like that's kind of where he's like thank you Groot okay I understand you now um mm-hmm. big uh big hero speech now mm-hmm. which is so important because now knowing rocket's backstory everyone but Groot here has like been stripped away from their home essentially or their mm-hmm. families drax mm-hmm. is because they were murdered star lord quite literally because they died of cancer and then he was abducted and then gamora because her whole race was wiped out and stolen by thanos and then rocket obviously from what we've seen with him mm-hmm. in, in the, the original uh flashbacks in guardians 3 so like it really is great to see how like such different personalities can come together by this unified thing. And I think that's what makes this even more of a better team up movie than the Avengers because the Avengers, I think they're all coming together because they're all superheroes and they were all approached by Nick Fury here. They're coming mm-hmm. together because they have a common motive, you know? Yeah. Or at least common, sure. uh, reason for fighting i guess Mm -hmm. person for fighting for Um, yeah and who knows maybe groot's been through some shit i I would love to know groot's backstory i mean how Groot ended up with rocket like that's like the one pocket we don't know yeah like that's the one piece of info we really don't see in anything because they're together at the start of this film and they're not together in the flashbacks of rocket and in guardians 3 so i would really Mm -hmm. like to see like where that moment is Oh, I love that's that. It's a great line from Drax. You're really out on Drax after this movie. I I love that. Oh. He's very formal in this movie. He definitely gets more silly in the next yeah. two. But Which, this yeah. one he he very starts off very like regal and stoic and like, you know, saying things like he said something earlier to Peter Quill in this movie where he was like comrade and like that's how he addressed him, and it. I mm. almost wish, like, I preferred this version of Drax over yeah, the version some, that he does. Yeah, there's still some really serious line delivery that just because of circumstances is funny in this one. Um, whereas next time it really goes into leans into the laughs. But mm. I think because the next films get even darker in subject matter, the laughs help even more. Because here it's still a little light, like. We've gotten the heavy stuff out of the way at the very beginning, but now this stuff is more about the kind of ragtag team together thing. Whereas the next one's pretty deep with, you know, with Yondu's death and with also just the idea of this father implanting a tumor in this kid's mother. And then the third film, obviously, with all the animal violence, I think it's like, you know, the Drax stuff, the silliness is amped up because of the seriousness of the story, if that makes sense. Like, there's almost a balance Mm -hmm. to be found. But I don't know. I dig it. But I do like this version of Jax. It's it's a lot simpler. We get our plan montage. Our planning yeah. montage. Which again, perfect classic movie thing of just like, you know what? Because we're going to see the plan, we don't need to hear about what's going to happen. We just need to kind of, mm-hmm. you know, get the crux of what's going to happen so we at least can comprehend when it is happening. But because we're seeing it, we don't need to necessarily hear mm-hmm. every little ounce and oomph. Oh yeah, there's there's Mr. JCR again. There he is. <laughs> I, I I will admit I love them, uh, John C and, and Glenn Close, but they are very underutilized in this franchise. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> I love the eye. It looks so cool. All right, Kels. Yes. This is a good time to ask since you were just singing along. What are your like top, let's say top three needle drops in this film? Or like if you want to give more, like what are your top tier? Like what's the top tier? Like, what are your favorite? Okay. Drops? Is Cherry Bomb? I one love, one? Um, I like Cherry Bomb. I don't know if it's top three, but I really like Ain't No Mountain High Enough right at the end when mm-hmm. they're flying off after their yeah, battle. Because I it, really it like the tone. it's like, well, there ain't no mountain high enough to keep me from like being with this group. Exactly. I really like the hooked on the feeling drop during the prison mm-hmm. sequence. And I mean, the opening with come and get your love is just iconic. Yeah. So those are definitely my top three. What about you, Dill? I mean, yeah, it, 
I think this is one more than any other one. Like, I feel like if you ask people about two or three, they're going to find more niche examples. Whereas this one, it really is. You know, the Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Come and Get Your Love. And then I would probably go with the I Want You Back ending as well. I don't hmm. know. I Want what, You what's Back. This song? Yeah, what's the song that they, um, when they're dancing off? Ooh, child. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another one, too. Yeah, I mean, easier. I don't know. This one just has a lot of classic ones. Um, I But I do prefer, overall, the mixtapes of two and three a little bit more. Three, especially, is just killer. Yeah. Well, that, that music is also closer to our time. Right. You know, with, like, the 90s. 70s, 80s, 90s, right? That's how they mirror them. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. What's the, the Silly Love Songs one? When, when do they sing that one? Silly love songs. Um, I, I, it's a different. There's a different name of the song, but the I love you. Hold on, let me find it. Maybe they don't sing that. I'll f- I'll find it another time. But I feel like it's one of the Gamora Peter songs, like when they're dancing. But I don't think it's this one. I think it's the next movie. Do they dance in the next movie together? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's that, whatever that song is. They is dance like to a Sam Cooke song that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I'm like Mandela affecting a song in my brain that's not in this maybe. Uh, in this franchise. Just because it feels like it fits the tone of it. Mm-hmm. I love the Guardians theme, too, because like a lot of the MCU films, I feel like the one thing that's missing. Exactly. I feel like the mm-hmm. one thing that's missing from a lot of the MCU films is like a concrete theme. You know, like Superman has a theme. Spider-Man, Raimi has a theme. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas I don't think you necessarily get uh, the Batman has a theme. Um, whereas I don't think these characters do as much, which is why it's nice that Guardians has one. Um, especially in a film that's all about the music sung. It's cool that there's still score moments that really shine, you know? Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. Gotta love a lot of gray gunk in my MCU. I feel you know, like I'm I the, old, just... the old man asking for kids to get off his lawn whenever I bring up the muddy visual effects. Sure. <laughs> but honestly, I was just thinking to myself, like these visuals are still attractive they, to yeah, me. They still feel yes, exactly. They are the best of that ilk. Because they at least still feel well thought out. It feels still feels like, okay, it makes sense for this to be here and there rather than like, let's just throw a bunch of smoke mm-hmm. there, you know? Especially because the ships also look so dang cool. Mm-hmm. Like those little stars. They almost look like little ninja stars. Denarian soul. <laughs> God, I'm living Take on my dick message. Oh, I love that shot. Oh, I love when a ship that feels too big goes into like a nice tight hole. That sounds awful. I don't Whoa. Know how to no, like, uh, like when All a right, ship. Jill. No, like when you think it's not, it's going to crash into something, but it, it just slides right through. Yeah, we all know what you meant. No, I just, yeah, thank you. It's just, there's no way to describe what I mean. I mean, you're, you're all hopefully watching the film with us. If not, like, thank you for just listening to us. But I hope you're actually watching the film along with us. Um, but yeah, like that moment. Like, there's a lot of that in Star Wars, too, where it's like, what's going to happen? And then, like, the Millennium Falcon tilts to its side and it slides right through. I'm like, ah, so good. I love Geography. how, com- how uh, Gamora says, we're just like Kevin Bacon. They're playing those seeds early. <laughs> do you think at this point when they're making this film, do you think they know they're going to get Kevin Bacon in the MCU at some point as like a cameo in one of these movies? Or do you think that I was mean, like I, a, a far-fetched I feel dream? Like James Gunn is definitely hoping. I don't know if it was like set in stone yet during this time, but I think it's definitely a uh, a want, mm-hmm. a desire. Uh, 
Oh, I love this. There's just such a good camaraderie in this film that is so well executed. Oh. Mm-hmm. It's like a beautiful honeycomb. Mm-hmm. Do you like that cereal, honeycomb? Have you ever had it? I do. What's I your do, favorite do. cereal, Kels? I don't think we've ever talked about this. Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Basic. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Oh, what's <laughs> no, yours? Frosted Flakes. That's, That's a good one. more basic, but, you know. I like it simple. Yeah, I get it. Sometimes no, less no is more. Whistles. Yeah, exactly. I don't want just the flakes, but, like, give me a little frost, and I'm good. <gasps> oh, Groot. This is where I think we start crying. <laughs> Almost. So this is when I probably had said at some point out loud, out loud when I first watched this movie, like if anything happens to Gru, I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself. And until 2017, well, actually, no. The post credits, they they reassure you he will be back in some entity, um, right? His offspring, but that had to get pointed out to me though. Like my, I couldn't see out of my eyes. They were crying so hard. They're like, look, he's still there. Well, look, at the time, back. people thought it was him and not his son. Um. Which is kind of weird to think about because, like, he consistently, like, chews pieces of twig and leaf off of himself. Like, mm-hmm. are those just, like, baby Groots that haven't been sprouted? Like, <laughs> no, I think. Like, are those little children? He's just like, ah. Right. It would make a lot of gun sense if that was, you know. And that's all Trash we see, Gamora. <laughs> fucked of Nebulimi. <gasps> Nobody talks to my friends like that. You really have an identity crisis tonight. You keep calling Nebula Gamora. And you keep calling Rocket Groot. I just called Nebula Gamora? You said that's the last we'll see of Gamora. It's okay. Oh my god. That happens. I'm really oh not my god, is this, this is a final showdown in daylight? I love it. You know how I love daylight in Marvel movies because there's far too much. Oh no, it's about to be a night sequence. Let's make it rain or make it nighttime. <laughs> Right. Ooh, look at that face. Yeah, that was kind of creepy. I hated it. It was like... It was like the dune sandworm. Ugh. In his mouth. I didn't like it. I love this arrow thing. It's just such a fun, creative superpower, I guess. And then they all collapse. I love it. Like, that's so good. Yeah. I like the arrow, the ship exploding in the background. Was like kind of goofy. Yeah, it's a little excess. This is not the last we'll see of Gamo- a Nebula. She's uh, she's fixing herself. Good Nebula. Right I love that. Oh my god. So, what I love so much about Nebula in, in this movie is they really lean into the robotness of it. Like when she just like, mm-hmm. <sighs> like oh, I just freaking love that shit. Because that's all acting. That's not visual effects. That's like Karen Gillan like contorting and like shifting her chin muscles. Mm-hmm. Aided by maybe a little bit of visual effects, but right. No, hold your positions. That guy's got a great voice. He does. Every time he's spoken, you've repeated the line back, which means that that's when you know you've got a good voice. But people just yeah. want to like say it again. It's like repeat mimic after it. Me. Yeah, mimic. That's the perfect word for what I was looking for. Yeah, they want to sure. say it again and quote it. Uh, mimic. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Innocent people. In hey, that I think that's John C. Riley's family. Yeah. He's got a beautiful wife. <laughs> mm. I don't have a uh, a trivia tidbit written down, but I did read about like Digimon Hansu and his like involvement in the fact that his his son apparently one day said to him he was like I read this in like an interview. He was like, dad, I wish my skin were a little lighter so I could play a superhero. And he goes, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, because like all the superheroes are, are white. And I just think it's cool that we've evolved so much. And that's what made mm-hmm. him want to do this movie is he's like, well, I'm going to do a superhero movie for you, kid. Um, and then he does that and he's going to be in another one, right? He's, he's, he's in something coming up. 
Um, a Quiet Place part. Yeah, uh, but there's like another one. super. I think there's another superhero movie. He's he's. Let me see. What a cool name too, Digimon Hansu. Oh, he's in the mm-hmm. Shazam movies. He's in Captain Marvel. What's the one I'm thinking of though? Quiet Place. Maybe that was maybe it was Quiet Place, but I feel like there's one more thing. That he's like gonna be in. Oh, he was in Black Adam. He was in Aquaman. He's been a lot of shit. It's always I mean, fun to watch Groot kind of really use his powers to his full extent because we don't all often see it. And he's right. not really a violent creature by nature. So we don't always understand fully what he can do. But when he's defending his friends, he's going full out. <laughs> yeah that the, that stuff is so good because it's still very stoic but yeah. so matter of fact oh my god look at what he's doing to these people what a good what a good boy what a good boy who's a good I, boy I, I honestly think if he doesn't die in this movie Groot could be like next to maybe Hulk and like Thor maybe like the third biggest like force in that end game fight you know yeah that little smile he does when he turns around he's like did i do a good job like he's Mm -hmm. just he's such a good good boy boy. tis the what tinder on which you burn yeah oh god that's That's a a really powerful staff he has i think it's because the power stone isn't it all our lives burn on tinder (laughs) that was the joke i was leading up to Gotcha. Oh, this poor guy. What's his name again? Saul. Oh, I was like... Well, because he said his name again in that fabulous accent. So I was like, hmm. Peter... Commander Saul. Sarah Finowitz or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's, that's Peter Sarah Finowitz. Yeah. Gotcha. He's got a great voice, too. Honestly, I'm starting to feel the way I felt during the ending of Winter Soldier. And I really oh, yeah? don't remember the person I was at the end of Winter Soldier. So whatever comes out of my mouth from here on out is not. Are you getting tired, Gil? It's only 11. Oh, this is when we started oh, our Winter Soldier uh, oh, commentary last time. And that was a whole half hour. I think it was a half hour longer than this is. Like, this is a short Marvel movie in retrospect. Like, two hours? It's a tight two. Including right. post-credits. Like, that's pretty good. Like, yeah. it's two hours and, like, one minute. You know? And then it doesn't Disney Plus, say it's, like, it's two welcome. Two minutes, you know? Because it's, like, the extra credits. Um, Just wanted to bring up about Peter Serafino. It's the voice of Darth Maul um, in Star Wars Phantom Menace. Just a great voice. A, a great menacing mm. Or just deep brooding voice, which is really great to see. And he's apparently in the Sing movies. I don't know which animal he sings as, but oh, he plays Big Daddy. He plays the big, uh, big gorilla, Johnny's dad. So nice. Do you like those movies, the Sing movies? Yeah, I do. You do? Okay. I thought you were gonna say you've never seen them, and I was like, we are watching those next after this. I've seen the first one. I don't think I've seen the second one. Right, but I have, really like, just like Taron Edgerton, and that's why I like those movies. Okay, but also like Scar Jo. Um, we're going to have to do another Scarlet movie club and add Sing 2 to the list. Does oh. she sing in it? Yeah, she's uh, she's the porcupine. Um, I just know that Reese Witherspoon is the pig. Yes, she is. And so Tori Reese, Kelly is an elephant. Tori Kelly's I the think. elephant. Yep, Tori Kelephant. Um, Matthew McConaughey is in those movies. Yes, as the little koala. Koala. Um, koala. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Taryn Edgerton as the uh, as the gorilla. Bono makes an appearance as a lion, I believe, in in the the second one. Like Bono mm. from U two. Um, yeah. Seth MacFarlane was the mouse in the first one, but he doesn't return for the second one. Big big Aww. shame. Yeah. Um, Nick Kroll's in it. Nick Offerman. Letitia Wright. Is is in the new one? I remember her in that one. She's great. Oh. 
our, our Black Panther. So we'll have to do a movie club for her and, and do that film. Um, even though she's not really in a lot of movies, but uh, aside from mm. Black Panther, but we'll we'll have to do it because she's in at least three. She's in uh, the Small Axe movies, which are great. She's in Sing Two. She's in Death on the Nile. That's enough. We can we can do that. That'll be the way we watch Sing Two. Well, we've reached our big sacrificial moment. Yeah, how you feeling, Kelsey? You, you upset to watch this happen again, or have you seen it enough times where you're like, okay? I think I've seen it enough that I I know what's coming. But yeah, I'll tell tough. you, man. It's tough knowing it's that the little Groot is not actually him. It's like an offspring, right? And the music is so good. The way it swells. Who who did the music for this? Is it Giacchino or no? Tyler Bates. Tyler Bates. There's our trivia champ right there. One, if you're a trivia champ, always a trivia champ. You, Stacy, and Tato are big three. Yeah, Tyler Bates did, did the music for the first two, and then John Murphy did the music for the third. Isn't Don, John Murphy the name of the good doctor? Or is that Sean Murphy? I think it's Sean. I've never seen the good doctor, <laughs> but I think it's Sean. It's funny because like there's there's shows I just didn't know people watched until like a few months ago when they ended and people are like, Oh my god, young Sheldon. And I'm like, When when was this a show? When when did were people watching this? No, the literally. Good doctor, everyone's like, Oh my god, the good doctor 2017 to 2024. I'm like, what? No, oh. yeah. Oh, and the little lights. This is then, beautiful what he's doing in here. Oh, Drax is feeling himself there. Oh yeah. Can I just say, like, this is my dream to be like in wrapped up yeah. in a little tree cocoon with a raccoon with some like fairy twinkling lights bioluminescence this is a great like party aesthetic like i would love to have like a backyard like barbecue mm -hmm. and then like at night we have like some drinks oh. by uh, you know by a little it's almost like fireflies oh and then the aspect ratio grows a little bit wait did he and say it, we are Groot? we he said we are over. Groot. Oh, okay it's okay because Rocket said, no, you'll die. And he said, we are Groot. Fuck. Oh, my God. Just twist the knife while it's Fuck in yeah. there. Why don't you? Damn. This is the Ooh Child. Yeah, I like this one. Because it's like, it's easing the pain a bit. It's like, yeah, man. Right. Like, we definitely need some lightheartedness now coming this off is, of this. This is my mom's major favorite loss. MCU movie. This is my mom's favorite MCU movie. I think because of this moment when she watched this, she was just so just, oh my God, with all the sticks lying around. Yeah, she was she was a mess watching this the first time, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you were, as I'm sure we all were. Because we didn't even really talk about your first time watching this, Kels. It was, do you want to tell us just your first experience with this film? So the first time I ever watched this was at, um, a movie night that Dill and I did. Uh, we were invited um, a post performance at our high school. And so our kind of last hurrah as a class was having a movie night at the school. At the theater. And, so they like kind of brought this big screen down at the actual yeah. auditorium where we performed the shows. And it was like, we turned it into right. a movie theater for a night. It was exactly. Really and so I'm watching this movie, having the absolute best time of my life, head over heels in love with Groot. I'm verbally saying out loud throughout the whole movie, like, oh, I love Groot. I love this guy. Love him, love him, love him. If anything and I'm happens making, to him. I'm making eyes at our teacher, Miss Marconi, at the time. And I'm like, I'm looking at him. I'm like. <laughs> yeah, know, she's we're, in we're for a rude awakening. Like, yeah. Right. And so I fully break down sobbing. Um it like was, literally it was a sight to see, but it also broke our hearts watching it. But yeah, uh, it was eyes, eyes red, like gasping for air, like <gasps> like what do you mean? And it just really, really broke me. And thank God that he was resurrected at the end of this movie, or else I don't know what would have happened to little high school me. <laughs> and this was a pre- guardians 2 world too so like i bet if had guardians 2 had come out by then you would have seen like a little groot over all the marketing and you would have just been mm -hmm. like oh isn't he like a little baby and you would have maybe put it together but i think because sure. we didn't know that it was like a real true shock for you and, and i remember that being a big moment um for everyone who watched it because like that was the breakout character even more mm -hmm. than rocket even more than obviously peter quill um mm -hmm. especially gamora and drax who are given probably the least to do in this film but Ooh. 
Ooh. Why would you? What I mean, do? I guess it it works out for him, but it's like, why would you tell him you're distracting him? Because then he's obviously going to look the other way. That's the kind of stuff that Peter Quill does that pisses me off. <laughs> mm. It's the same thing with the well, fucking Thanos you know. thing. If you had just given it 10 more seconds, you could have gotten that fucking glove off of Thanos' hand. Here, if you had just kept dancing for 10 more seconds without telling him, hey, it's a distraction, he wouldn't have looked the other way, and maybe it would have been easier to get the freaking thing out of his hands. Or blast his fucking head off. I don't know. Listen. It works, he's but... Not... I don't know. He's not the brightest bulb. In the bunch. We know this. It's the dimmest. You know, it kind of reminds me of Elioth from Loki mm. in the void. Yes. And so now they need to use the power of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Ugh, call back. I love this click kind of kaleidoscopic rainbow yeah. visual, almost like it's underwater in a way. Good acting yeah. from from Mr. Pratt, Mr. Mm -hmm. Garfield, Mr. Lasagna lover. Have you seen the new Garfield yet, Kels? No. <laughs> I know you I, I still, know you're rushing out to go see it, but I still haven't even seen Super Mario, so <laughs> I, I, I'm behind the times yeah. when it comes okay. to Chris Pratt lore. Mm -hmm. but you know what movie I love? Mm. The Lego movie. It's a good movie, hey. Whoop, there. there it is. You know what I think we should do? Because there's so much off-season between movies and stuff. I'm wondering if we should do, like, a Guardians movie club for, like, August slash September area where we, mm. like, watch Zoe Saldana, Chris Pratt, Dave Bautista, Bradley Cooper, and, like, Vin Diesel movies. Just do the big five. I would love, I would yeah. love that. Take five weeks doing those. That'd be fun. Guardians movie yeah. club. And then if we have time, we could do, like, Michael Rooker and, and Karen Gillan and Palm Clementif. Yeah. And Maria Bakalova, who's playing Ivana Trump in the new movie The Apprentice with Sebastian Stan as Donald Trump, which can't That's... find distribution because it's being sued, which I freaking love. Um, oh, my God. They're like, you're making us look bad. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> anyway, not right. getting political. Um, all I'll say is, I am Groot. That's where I'll end the politic talk. Maybe for Michael Rooker, I'll make you watch like the first season of Walking Dead because it's only like six or seven episodes because it's mm. a short pilot season and he's only really in that first season and then he comes back in like season three. So like, maybe we watch mm. like the first season of Walking Dead. That might be fun. Is The Walking Dead scary? No more scary than the What If Zombies episode. You know, it's it's zombie lore. It's like there's no jump scares. It's more of like what you'd get in like a, just a zombie flick. So. Yeah, you're all you all you just went to see the strangers though. You're, I, you're a horror I know, person. but I, I I am I am, but the jump scares are scary sometimes. Not I'm scares. not it's immune. Not jump scares. It's not jump scares. I'll tell you that. Okay, it's not that kind of scary. How what we you never said it? How was the strangers? Was it good? The new. Do you one? want me to read my letterbox review? Because I've heard nothing but shit from everyone else, so I'd love to hear well, your letterbox review. I can tell you, I gave it two stars on letterbox. Yeah, not, not a huge fan. No, it definitely wasn't. It wasn't like, you know, the worst thing you've ever seen. Shattering any glass ceilings or anything when it yeah. came to the horror genre. I only give really long reviews for movies that I dislike. Um, the two stars are for Madeline Petch and Madeline Petch only. She carried this film on her back. This concept has really lost its novelty because if you've seen the first one, you know how it's going to end. And spoiler alert, not well. There is no triumphant fi final girl. There is no act three revenge plot. And essentially there is no resolution. Although this new revamped take on the strangers seemingly tries to make it seem like the small town this poor couple has wandered into is in on their murder. It completely takes away from the point the original is trying to make. Sometimes you're just the wrong person at the wrong time. Plus... Mm -hmm. What made the original so unique was because it was one of the very few horror films that left audiences feeling unsatisfied, but in a good way, like in a crazy, I can't believe that just happened sort of way. Mm -hmm. Maybe throughout the SCU, the Stranger Cinematic Universe, future yeah, really films will have more of a payoff and maybe just maybe we'll get some answers behind who Scarecrow, Pinup, and Dollface are. But do we really need them? 
Good point. A great review. Great job, Kels. Thank Good you. Point. Quit the wordsmith. Um, I, yeah, I, I learned was, I from the best. You, I was trying to make you talk without having to watch what's going on, which is Rocket mourning over a twig, um, which is oh, very yeah. to watch him holding that little right, twig. So now we, we've moved on to the next scene. I just wanted, I knew that would be a good time to make you read your review. I didn't realize it was that long, but it was a perfect amount of time to okay, distract great. from that. Um, so now we're back. We're wrapping things up. Um, yeah, and so we're teasing into the future plot lines of uh, Guardians 2, which is uh, Peter Quill's heritage and who mm-hmm. his father is. Right. And I, I'll just say right now, I know Winter Soldier is just naturally a half hour longer, but like compared to the last, and we were both tired for the last commentary, but I just feel like this movie, mm-hmm. just the pacing is so much better. Like I'm, mm-hmm. we're at the end mm-hmm. here and it's like, wow, we're already at the end. Like it just right. moves so well, even though again, like I said, like not a ton happens, you know, it's more about character, but it, it just, it moves. Just the moments are so like well integrated within each other. Oh, I the love that fit. Gamora okay, outfit. Stuck. Yeah, that's that's a good a little fit skirt for moment. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the moments of action, comedy, drama—they all interlap each other so perfectly, which allows this movie to you know live in all those separate moments, but also Absolutely. just like you know be paced well. Oh, he gets his ship back. I really, really, really want to go to Epcot and ride the new Guardians ride because oh, it looks so fun. Cosmic it does look like a lot of fun. Because you get a different song every time you go. You There's six songs you get. Either, I think it's like September, Disco Inferno, Everybody Wants to Rule mm. the World, mm. Conga, um, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, and what's the sixth one? It's, um, I forget what it is, but I, I got close. I got five out of the six, but you, you did better than I could you get a different song every time, which is fun. And then there's the one in, in California, which is the basically what they changed the tower of terror to be, which is the guardians mission breakout, which we will be mm-hmm. riding at some point when we decide to go to California for the, the subathon of rewards. It will happen. Maybe not this year, well, but within the calendar year, hopefully we're both saving our pennies at home, Dill. So yes. that, well, that's also part of it. That's why I, I made it a tier. Cause I kind of, I was like, you know what? Kelsey's home for the summer. I'm moving back home with my parents for a bit of time just to save money. Honestly, cause living in New York is freaking expensive. And if mm-hmm. you know, my, my roommate mm-hmm. is obviously uh, doing great things with his career, but could not commit to the lease. And I was like, you know, instead of scrambling for a new roommate, move home for a little while, save some money. And, and I really do think right. it's going to pay off when we're riding those freaking Avengers campus rides. And we're like, money well saved and because exactly. also with the new subscribers hopefully we'll be able to monetize this channel and be able to help pay off the hard work but even then we do this for free because we love it um mm-hmm. and we love it because of moments like this the movie magic of this final bookend full circle moment mm-hmm. perfect full circle perfect. and what a perfect way to set up a second movie than to give him a new walkman of new music mm-hmm. that says volume two. Yes. Yes. Good point. Mm. My little star Lord. Oh, and the reveal to find out that star Lord was something that his mom called him. Yeah. It's just a really perfect wrap up of the story as he's unwrapping this. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Mix volume two. So mm-hmm. technically, this is the first of the second mm-hmm. awesome mix. Is ain't no mountain high enough? Yeah, I guess. Even though when they released, obviously when they released the movie, the awesome mix, this was on that mix because it was this movie. But oh, and I love how like each lyric kind of lines up with one of them. Like, if you need me, call me, and it's like Gamora. Just call yeah. my name. Uh, she starts to dance a little bit. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zoe she's Saldana is so freaking good in this movie and every movie. She's in my top yeah. ten actresses all time. Love, love, love her. And this is a great like moment for Yondu as well because he's about to open up the orb and see the troll, and he kind of almost has this moment of pride of like, ah, oh, of course yeah. he didn't give me the stone, you know? And that also sets the tone for the next one, too, because it's like you need to like Yondu going into the second one. He can't be a villain. Yeah. He has to be this kind of gray area in between anti-hero, so the second film hits the way it exactly. does. Exactly. And, oh, this moment, too. Oh, and uh, it's a little girl. And here oh is God. the pink 
girl and mother from the bridge scene that I pointed out earlier. Yeah, these movies are so good. Very sweet. So, a little more inside baseball. Uh, Carly, for her donation of the last subathon, asked for me to do a James Gunn ranking. I am Mm. almost done watching Peacemaker, and then I'm going to make that ranking video. This was going to rank lower, but I think then some things... Um, but having rewatched it, I think it's going to be a lot higher on the list than I expected wow. it to be. And that's only because there's so many great things. Beta both. Done, but, um, Sorry, yeah. just saying the line. I hear good. She's turned on there. She's like, mm. that's kind of cute. Star not turned Lord. on, but she's like, she's flirting. She's flirting. Mm, 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 mm. I love this needle mm, drop. Yeah. Mm, mm. Mm. I can't believe that's it. We're going to actually stay through the credits and, and talk about the post credits again this time. We're, we're recording a little earlier than we did last time. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy will return. Guardians of the Galaxy will return. Also because Ugh. the tunes are so good. Oh, here we go. Oh. Just the Shouldn't subtle dance moves and then he, he just starts like adding a little bit more hips and a little bit more arms. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how it's Drax because he is the stoic one in this one. That he's the mm. one getting kind of fucked with. And he's just sharpening a blade as well. And this little guy could not <laughs> care less. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when I actually saw Guardians 2, since I, I missed this one in theaters the first time, I watched it on DVD, as I said, before the Oscars in 2015, I think. Because um, it was nominated for the 2015 Oscars. But I remember... Um, watching this and in in a theater in in when guardians 2 came out it was you bought like a double bill and you got to see guardians 1 at six o'clock and then at nine o'clock they showed guardians 2 so it was really cool i got to watch it in theaters finally and i just remember the audience even though we had all seen the movie before and we were amped for the second one we were just Mm. still loving that last little bit with with Groot. you know it's actually a lot Mm -hmm. shorter than i thought it was i thought that bit was longer all right, let's look for some uh, some uh, food names here. Oh. See anything? These these names are moving pretty fast. Nathan Fillion in the monstrous inmate role. I love that. We have oh, Enoch wow. Frost. So I guess if you frost a cake. Uh, Rob Zombie. Oh, I didn't even realize he's the Ravager voice. Huh. Rob Zombie's in this? I, you learn something new every day. These movies, these names are moving pretty fast. Or is it just me? No, they're moving quick. They're also really small because I have my screen smaller. Oh, okay. So I'm like trying to find food. A Cochrane, which is close to cocktail, but not quite. Kill? I almost read the same name, but I almost completely butchered it and I'm said something. Actually, I wish you had. Um, Norberry, not not a not a strawberry or blackberry, but Harvey. Sorry, that was just the first one I saw. <laughs> <laughs> not a... Rachel Curry. That's the closest one so far, but still a dish. That's not really a food. It's it's a preparation. Right, right. But curry is the closest we've gotten so far. Shepherd again, like shepherd pie. Shakespeare, Claire Shakespeare, art department assistant. Mm. I bet the people who are watching this, aka all these people in the credits, are like, oh my god, they're saying my name. Here you go, Jay Maidment. I said your name. Congratulations. Alan Wilson, Clive, I said your name. Clive Ward. Great food, Clive Ward. Did you get that com- confused with cloves? No. I was just, just saying someone's like saying name, name. Okay. to make them feel good. Okay. Jake O'Kane. There's a Survivor contestant named Jake O'Kane. I wonder if it's the same one. Oh, that's Jane O'Kane. Never mind. The mm-hmm. Gamora double. <laughs> oh, Jake O'Kane is not the good board though. Barry May Layborn. Yeah, there's some cool names here. Oh, Dominic Fish. Okay, so we got Fish. That's probably the best one so far. Oh, that's good. Steve Love. You can always eat love, I guess. Chomp on that so love. Everything's ang, cooked ang, with ang. love. If everything's cooked exactly. with love, then you're eating love all the time. Ryan um, Potter. I saw that as well. But again, can't eat Potter. I love how we're like, let's look for food names, and you're like, Potter. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a Fisher. Um, I don't know. I think Fish is the closest one, but it was spelled F Y S H. 
There's oh, like fish God. You can eat fish. These are just moving so fast. Um, yeah, very, very um, slim pickings with food names here. This is, uh, of course, a, a tradition that originated with Dan Merle and Mara Kanopic, Um, that when they do their commentaries and, and watch along as they do play this game where they look for food names in the credits. All right, there's got to be something in this giant list of digital artists, but my eyes are going to fall out of my sockets if I keep looking for each one. Let's see. Nothing. That's crazy. They're all blending together on my end. <laughs> Let's see. Brendan Seals. You can't eat a seal, can you? I guess you could if you were really hungry in, in the Antarctic. Well, sharks certainly eat seals, so I think that's a food. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of sharks watching today, so... <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> chomp, chomp, chomp. Um... There's got to be something coming up. I feel good. I feel like we're going to get like one really clear one by the end. We're going to be like, oh, bingo, you know? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, time's running His out. His last There's name Matt is Eaton. Eaton. Yeah, he's Matt Eaton. What, what is he eating, though? We need to know. Um, Let's see. I feel it. I feel like it's going to happen any second. It's going to happen. It's going to be May. It happens sometime. Let's see. James Baker. He's baking bread, but what kind of bread is he baking? Hmm. I wish they had credited Bass. Here. Bane Ooh, Bass. There you go. Bass Dane is Bass. A fish. Are you sure that's not Dane Das? Oh, I can't see. Rene Russo is a sound accountant. Is that true? Oh, we know Rene Russo. Maybe it's she... a different. It's got to be a different one stars in okay the, let's see any the of these uh these artists oh pina colada song that's a fruit that right pina colada or a cherry bomb duh cherry well, that's well that's a drink all right but a pina colada okay. i'm gonna say asterisk no it cherry, counts cherry, cherry bomb is the closest to getting a food in the credits but i found fish, dane bass so i'm pretty sure it was dane das but Let's no raccoons or tree creatures were harmed during the making of this film. I love that. Just so you know. Hope everyone had a great Father's Day yesterday, by the way. This is not the one about dads and fathers and daddies, but hope Happy you all... Happy Father's Day, Dale. Fathers, dads, daddies. <laughs> Don't wish me one. I am not one. I guess I am oh. to a dog. I'm a, little, I'm a dog dad. Let's see who we're getting in our little P... <gasps> Speaking of dog dads, look at this. P-S-C. There she is. She's a good girl. What a good girl. She's so cute. Howard the Duck. Seth Green himself. I love how that's it. Oh, like, God. that's like... And I love how they give, like, one last little credit where they're like, hey, just so you know, Howard the Duck was created by... Um, so that concludes Guardians. Did you... Okay, just a question. On Disney+, Plus, does it suggest yes. another project for you to watch after? Yeah. What did it suggest for you? Secret Invasion. Me too! I wonder if that's just Crazy. What, what it always suggests because they're like, only 10 people watch this. Please, someone else. Um, right, right. Anyway, I saw that and I went, nope, nope, X'd out of it. But thank you so much for watching, everyone. Our Guardians of the Galaxy commentary track, or listening, I guess. Uh, it would have been cool if you watched, too. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we dress nice for this. I put on mm -hmm. my, I, when I wore this for my headshots, people said I looked like Star-Lord in it because I had it open with like a purple shirt underneath. I don't Ooh, know. So sexy. I it, was a, it was a good one to wear for this. Um, but thank you guys so much. It was so much fun talking about the two big MCU movies that came out in 2014. We're not done yet with 2014. Um, maybe not next week, but sometime in the near future, we are going to also talk about TASM 2, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, because that was a 2014 film. Uh, maybe do something related to Days of Future Past. We did cover Days of Future Past in its own podcast a while ago, but we are doing something X-Men themed soon, especially with Deadpool and Wolverine coming out, so stay tuned for all that. Uh, it's going to be a fun time here on Marvelous Movie Mondays, but Kelsey, do you have anything to plug um, before we say goodnight to all our viewers and listeners? No, just um, follow me on TikTok and Letterbox. Those are the two places that I'm the most active these days. Um, and uh, thanks for another 
uh, sticking through another late night edition of me and Dill yes. as we're but, both yawning and falling again, asleep. The, these come out in a Monday morning, but just know we record these. Uh, this one we're ending at Saturday night, 1143 PM. So uh, again, not too late, but the last one we did, we started around 1130 and ended around like 3 AM. What? Or right. like two, two a.m. Probably two, oh, yeah. Yeah, probably two, 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 two. Um, but still, we put a lot of effort into these because we want you guys to have great things for your ears to listen to. So thank you so much. And please let us know down below if Guardians held up for you, uh, if it held up better because of our banter, if it held up worse because of our chit chat, or uh, if if you have any Marvel hot takes or or other suggestions for Marvel things you want to see us do. As we announced here, we are going to be doing a Guardians movie club uh, in the coming future with. Uh, Pratt movies, Saldana movies, Batista movies, um, Cooper movies, and D- Diesel movies. So let us know in the comments below what movies you might want to see for those. We pick three per actor. Um, so uh, let us know what your favorite Fast and Furious movie is because we're not watching all of them for Vin. Hell no. Mm. Um, but thank you guys so much for watching and we'll see you next time. I am Groot. We are Groot. Peace out. Peace out.